Silver Clock. I will call together this meeting of the uh, special meeting of the Water Rights Select Board on Monday, the 9th of September, 2021. First item on the agenda is to approve the agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any, uh, any abstentions? Okay. The agenda is approved as written. Next item is the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? I move to approve the consent agenda as written. Second. Moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Next is the public session. Anyone wishing to address anything not on the warrant agenda, I would ask to please step forward uh, or raise your hands online. And please uh, keep your, minute, your comments to three minutes if you can. Roger, thanks. thanks. Sure. Thank Just you. wanted to know if Tom could kind of cover an update on uh, paving projects and uh, if there's any consideration. <coughs> I haven't seen anything going on with Neil and Flats. Um, didn't know if maybe they could convince the town to, if they're still moving forward with some paving project, to consider doing from the bridge that's being worked on now up to where we left off at the town shed there. Yeah. That, that um, stretch as opposed to Neyland Flats. Neyland Flats is high on the list. Um, all the contractors lost so much time this summer sure. dealing with all the flood stuff. Um, Union Street is going to start um, around the end of the month. Um, and that's kind of the last big one for the year. So the hope was to start chimming and milling Neyland Flats this summer. It's just not going to happen. Uh, what I've told the road crew is um, get done with Sweet Road and then, and then Neyland Flats just spend the entire fall knocking down the shoulders and getting ditches and getting it ready to go. Okay. So I think it's really high on the list. I recognize it's really from um, you know, really, almost the whole length of it needs right. it needs a new code at this point. So there's no hope for probably anything I've got the road. Um, I don't know if you heard me from, from the bridge. Yeah, not no not percent. this not this year, but yeah, Neyland and Gupta are I think the next two that yeah. we need to hit hard. Okay. All right. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Anyone else? Anyone online? Roger. Chris. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I'll, talk, I'll talk to you after this. Sorry. Anybody? Yeah. Um, do I need to say my name? And Katia D'Angelo, Railroad Street. Um, I am here to respectfully request that the select board initiate a comprehensive planning process for the establishment of a local police department in the next two to four years. I know you guys have a ton on your plate right now with flood recovery among just the normal stuff. Um, but our town has experienced incredible growth in the last couple of years. Um, we are focusing on increasing affordable housing, which will bring even more increase in population. Um, and we, without an effective law enforcement, um, method, I think that the crime could continue to rise. Just last weekend, the Glen Bug reported on four major crimes in town. <coughs> um, you know, in the last couple of years, or the, actually a couple of weeks ago, the gas station clerk was attacked. Um, there's been abandoned cars. Obviously, speeding is an issue. We hear about the comfort trauma that. Um, there's been shoplifting, car break-ins, drug-related attacks. Those are just the ones that I kind of off the top of my head. Um, and there were some several mental health episodes that occurred in businesses last summer. Um, one that resulted in a no trespassing order and businesses were left to deal with that by ourselves. Um, if you know crime rates rise, businesses are at risk directly from theft or property damage, we lose tourist traffic, we lose shoppers, businesses help make our town vibrant. Um, and you know, the economic viability of Waterbury could suffer. Um, 
I intend to email you guys this and potentially turn it into a bishop petition. I don't know. We'll see. Um, but you know, I think now is the time to have the like to start that conversation. Um, and I know you're talking about the division of the local tax option later. Maybe this is a part of that um, because if we wait until there's like real critical mass, it's too late to just start planning at that point. So um, anyway, that's it. Thank you for considering it. Thank you. Thank you, Katya. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. All right. Let's move forward uh, with the appointment of the library commissioner. Uh, we did receive a uh, letter from the library commission, uh, which I don't know if you care to address that. Um, no, I just wanted to say the commission met earlier today, and um, we had Erin Lee, who's been recommended for appointment at that meeting, and uh, everybody supported her. Mm -hmm. And uh, the board had the occasion to uh, interview both candidates, uh, Aaron Looney and Christine Knoll. Uh, both of us were impressed with, I mean, all of us were impressed with both candidates. Uh, and we uh, decided to wait for the recommendation from the commission, which we now have. So do we have a motion? I move to. <coughs> Appoint Aaron Mooney to the Library Commission um, for the term ending on March 4th, 2025. Okay. Do I have a second? I'll second it. Moved and seconded. For the discussion? Just noting this goes till March of this year, and anyone can run a town meeting because there'll be slots available. Mm -hmm. Uh -huh. <laughs> okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. Congratulations to Aaron. Yeah. And we look forward to uh, more nominees coming forward uh, in the coming year. Thanks so much. Goodbye. All right. Uh, <clears throat> Natural Disaster Management Committee update. Uh, Matt. And I uh, appreciate you uh, coming. I understand that uh, you're not here to present the guide as was previously thought, but I uh, uh, appreciate you coming forward with you. Absolutely. Um, just to make it official, I'm Matt Dugan from the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee. And I'm um, here on behalf <coughs> of that committee. Uh, to give you an update on the manual. And uh, so what I'm going to do is give you a short summary of its status. And then I'll be um, letting you know what's in it. And uh, then I'm happy to answer any questions or make any comments about anything I missed, or if you have anything to add to it. So first, it's a working document. It's not a complete document. Um, it's finished in draft form, uh, awaiting comments. Uh, the plan is that uh, all but one of our committee members have weighed in on it to date. We're waiting for the last one to do so. When I receive comments from that last person, I am going to compile all the comments uh, that our committee has given me, um, or we'll debate and discuss those at our next meeting. Um, and then I will assemble that into the next draft, which will then go to crew because we consider their comments vital. Um, we don't know everything that they know. Then I'm going to edit it again, and then it'll be ready to present to the board. Um, as for the delivery date, uh, the best I can say is this is going to move at the speed of, of humans. Um, uh, as quickly as we can get things together, I'm happy to edit them and get them to you. Um, I would imagine that uh, it will be done at some point this fall. I'm certainly going to be doing all I can to get it done as quickly as possible, the July flooding being a good reminder that uh, these things happen with regularity. 
as far as what it includes, I'll read uh, from the table of contents, then I'll give you a quick uh, review of what's in there. I promise you it won't take that long. Uh, so uh, start with the scenario, communication, volunteer management, job descriptions, the care and feeding of volunteers. Ma'am, sorry. Uh, is there audio issues or anything online? Sorry. No worries. Uh, after job descriptions was the care and feeding of volunteers, supplies and equipment, equipment that should be considered for purchase, and we end the document with forms and checklists. At this point, it's about a 30-page document. So the scenario serves as an introduction. Uh, for reasons obvious to all of us, it is flood-related. It's not handling ice or fire or tornado at this point, those, or whatever else might come our way. It is our intention to adapt what we have for those cases uh, once we get this done. Um, so the scenario has to do, there's a lot of overlap, obviously, in, in those areas anyway. Um, so part one, the scenario, the communication is part two. It's about all the parties who will need to be communicated with, um, uh, both in normal sort of preparatory times as well as in disaster times. So we're talking about volunteers and residents, how to prep people, um, and how to maximize response. Volunteer management is the next section. It's about the technical end of volunteering, checklists on what to bring to a site, um, organization of volunteers, the kinds of jobs volunteers get involved with, and so on. Uh, job descriptions is the next section. That's in two sections, the disaster response coordinator and the volunteers. As you are aware by now, uh, our committee and, and crew have both come to the conclusion that paid um, ready and steady preparation and disaster response coordinator is a necessity. Um, in other words, the town can't maintain a, an adequate disaster response relying on volunteers. And if there's another way, we haven't figured it out. Um, so that's our strong recommendation. Uh, the next section is the care and feeding of volunteers. It's about managing these critical people. For maximum physical and mental health. Um, so frankly, we can keep counting on them to show up and come back. The quicker we respond to things, the less damage there is and the less expensive things are. Um, and of course, there are other mental health benefits and so on and so forth to responding quickly. Uh, supplies and equipment. Unfortunately, that was the easiest section. We remembered pretty well from last year, uh, but we got a refresher this year. So it's just a list of everything from masks to gloves and so on and so forth that, that we uh, could think of. Equipment that should be considered for purchase, uh, that it was a result, is, a lot of this was the result of asking other people, obviously beyond our committee. Uh, but it's pretty self-explanatory. What, what delivers a good sort of, for lack of a better word, ROI, um, it's not really that. It's really about response time and, and um, uh, again, getting to people in those critical early hours. Um, what should we consider? What might we consider as a town and budget for? Uh, and then forms and checklists rounds out the document. That's uh, everything from the initial assessment form to uh, the, the sort of intake slash work list form and so on. So that's what we have in our first draft of the document. Are there any questions that, are, that I can answer? Or any any comments? Yeah, I'm just uh, wondering if you're addressing uh, the role of the uh, Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee vis-a-vis -vis those issues that you uh, uh, delineated. Uh, great question. It's certainly been one of internal uh, discussion. We opted, I'm hesitant to speak on behalf of the whole committee, but I, I believe I can say we have opted for laying out what the problem was and what the resource, needed resources were for now with the idea that we would, it's kind of like, let's figure out what all the slots are and then how to fill them. That's kind of the philosophy we've taken. Okay. Yeah. Thank you, and also I appreciate uh, you uh, coming forward because uh, 
you know, as much as we would not like to, another one to arrive, uh, just on the way here, I heard about uh, Hurricane Francine, which is uh, yeah. making uh, its way uh, through the Gulf of Mexico all along the same path as uh, right. the Hurricane Isabel in, uh, yes. in July. So, yes. Melissa. Um, forgive me, you said this, but if you could reiterate the uh, moving at the speed of people process, so if four out of five of your committee members have reviewed it, and can you just say the two next steps? I missed them. Um, it's getting it to crew. Yep. And well, the, uh, the next step is I will do an, another edit and then get it to crew. Um, obviously, I'll turn that around as quickly as humanly possible because um, it's going to take them moving at the speed of human, I would imagine, a couple weeks to yeah. give me all their comments. And then I will turn that around again and get that to you. Great. Sounds perfect. No, just reiterating, I appreciate the consideration of kind of the different groups and getting the input. Thanks. Yeah, and I, beyond that, if anyone else wants to comment or anything else that you all want to do with that, we're certainly open to that as well. It's, it's, that's, those are the steps that we've figured out so far. Okay. And you know, all, all suggestions are welcome after that. Yeah. Well, I, and I appreciate the, your approach uh, it, it being a working document. Uh, each disaster has its own characteristics uh, and merits its own response, uh, but uh, you know, our job is to do the best we can uh, with uh, what we see in front of us. Yeah, let's, let's kind of hope it's <laughs> it's descriptive, right? We're, we all uh, respond to the past, not necessarily the future. We're really good at defining the past, mm -hmm. but, but let's hope it's predictive. Um, and therefore it helps it prepare properly. Um, just, yeah, quickly, did you mention anything? I know you mentioned supplies, and we have did a great job storing supplies in the basement of this facility uh, for this July. Is there anything about storage in that document or supplies, supply storage? It, it is something that we have discussed, um, but we're trying not to put too many uh, Parts before horses. Sure. We, we understand there's going to be a storage yep. issue to solve. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, optimally, we'll have, <coughs> again, based on the past, who knows, hopefully we won't have something happen for another 20 years, but it would be nice to have things fully stocked and ready right. for day one. Very yeah. much so. Yeah. Um, oh. On that note, Ian. Um, when the ambulance service vacates its current building right behind our public works garage, mm -hmm. um, it's our building, we own it, that'll be available. Um, the mountain rescue team has a desire to be there. Right now they're sharing some space with the fire department and that doesn't work out all that well. Sure. Um, they could conceivably take a bay of the ambulance service building, but we've talked about um, buying a, a large enclosed trailer for the flood recovery efforts and that trailer could be in that building under cover and that might be a good storage place for it. Great. Movable with, you know, any one of our fleet of trucks. So yeah. that sounds like a good solution right there. And the ambulance will be service will be out uh, February, March. Yes capacity is Mark, do you yeah. know what you're thinking? Or, I don't know if you've had conversations about uh, what, what sort of capacity would you do for a uh, movable uh, supply trailer. <laughs> um, we, we have not gotten to the point with how many masks, how many buckets should we. It, it's a good question. It makes sense. Yeah. Just, just in looking at pricing, once you get a decent size enclosed trailer, you may as well go big because there's not that much big a differential between a 20-footer and a 15-footer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, no. um, Matt, can you touch on for the board um, <coughs> with reference to the coordinator position, which I understand is in the letter and probably in an upcoming uh, agenda item, but I think it relates um, what the role of the committee would be in conjunction with a coordinator? Uh, I'm trying to make sure I don't speculate and speak on behalf of the committee unduly. Uh, I, 
it, it, I don't also want to, I don't want to be too uh, vague. I, it, it certainly help as much as we possibly can and support as much as we possibly can. That's probably quite vague. But whatever model we set up, we're looking forward to not really folding our tent up and saying we've done our job. Again, it kind of goes back to the philosophy of let's define all the needs right. and then figure out where we can fit. And, and this was something that we talked about a lot. Like, and we did a lot of cart before horse talking, in my opinion, as we try to figure out what are we. And so this is the current model. Let's just figure out everything that we need, talk about <coughs> budgets eventually, um, and let things fall, find their place as far as where they, where they belong. Um, I hope that's a helpful answer and not overly vague. Vague is fine. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, per the letter we received on Sunday from the members of your committee, <laughs> um, it says that along with crew, you're jointly submitting a letter to strongly support the new position of flood mitigation and emergency planning grant manager and the creation of an additional disaster preparedness and response coordinator. Just recognizing that wasn't in all the materials posted online, just so that the public knows that. Your committee is formally, as a signatory of this letter, saying they think that's a good idea. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. appreciate that. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> um, and just to be clear, I I have full authority to hire fire for any position that exists in town government, but there is no response coordinator position that exists. So, yeah. select board wants me to work on a job description and come back to you. I can I can do that. Um, it's not a not a big deal to get started on that, but I, I can't fill a position until you authorize me to move forward. Okay. Any other questions from Matt? All right, thank you. Appreciate thank you, Matt. Thank you, Matt. All right. Next, we have the after action report from the crew. Thank you for bringing that to us, and we're going to go forward. Hi, I'm Michelle. Hello. I'm sorry, it's not shorter. More time, we'll get it there. So this is a joint project with Alyssa and um, all the folks who gave input, um, which is a lot, but we would certainly love some more. So whether that's here tonight, we'll take notes of what folks say, or um, depending on the discussion, if folks think we should put out for public comment, we can definitely do that. Um, we heard from a mix of folks, um, crew members. Um, uh, we requested input from a lot of people, but we primarily heard from crew members, volunteers, and flood-affected folks. Um, that's the majority of the feedback that we got. And then we did add things at, that had come up from various conversations that we had had. Um, so how do you want to, like, I, I don't want to redo this report. That would be a torture. Um, <laughs> Alyssa, I don't know if you have a thought or how do you want to? It was occurring to me after critiquing Tom that it might be worthwhile for me to join the meeting at least just so we could <laughs> share some of it because we all have copies just for the purposes of talking through it. <coughs> yeah, you do that? And they're like, yep. Okay. Um, and just really uh, following some kind of emergency management practice and other after action um, practice, like before, during, after. You know, I think um, probably covered that before here, but in the broader emergency management world or the world that um, disaster process lives in, there is preparation, there is the actual incident. There is first response, which is what we're talking, what crew did primarily this time around. And then there is um, midterm recovery, which is where we are now. And then long-term recovery, which is where we are for 2023. So there's all these stages and um, lots of talk about whether it's a cycle or not. As we know, when you're having recurrent, people can be in multiple stages at once. 
right, in a buyout from the 2023 stuff and experiencing flooding right this minute. But typically, like the emergency <coughs> management um, role and, and uh, like public works is when the roads are open. Right, people have been evacuated. Like when people are safe and the roads are open, that role ends and it moves into right this first response role, um, which all over the country is managed by uh, community groups with volunteers. There are lots of parts of the country where like it's only um, faith-based volunteers. Like it's not neighbor volunteers like we have here. Right, what Vermont has here is something pretty special. Um, and so that is something to, to just people should know, right? That kind of the way it works in other parts of the country, a lot of times, you know, there's folks who are just like, they don't do anything. They don't even clean up their own houses. They just wait for FEMA, you know, um, to, to show up. So we are in, right, at this time, we are in kind of like the, the early recovery phase. Um, and this is about the phases before that. Um, but happy to answer any questions about any of the pieces. Let's see if we did it. Ooh. All right. Oh, well done. With apologies to the people here for the resolution. Um. So there's just a little table of contents there, kind of, right? We did what happened in advance of the storm, what was happening during the storm, and then what happened really in the month after the storm. And um, the suggestions that folks had, which is the most important part. And then what is still to come um, will be a comparison with what we did last July, December, this July, like what's different. Mm -hmm. um, the uh, looking at are there suggestions from the after action report from um, August 2023 that we should have done and didn't, right? Like what are the things we want to make sure we bake into going forward into the National Natural Disaster Preparedness Manual, if it's a preparedness thing, or if there's um, response steps that we want to focus on. So I guess uh, if you could just hit uh, the highlights and what's uh, in the conversation. Um, uh, uh, on, I think the, the key findings and suggestions <coughs> on each of yep. those sections that you're doing, yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Yep. And the, you know, some of the things that just we, when we talk about the preparation, we did have, um, you know, some preparation around uh, it, Sandbags, right? We took we took some shots there. We did a lot better on August 10th because we had taken the shots, um, you know, and learned some stuff about it. I think there's still a lot more for us to learn there. A lot of opportunity. The people who had them felt that they helped. Um, we know they helped from a you know planning and preparedness standpoint for people, peace of mind wise. You know, we heard tons of that, especially after the town made sand and sandbags available. In August, right? There's a lot of positive feedback about that. Um, what we learned at the time, right? We didn't have enough person power. We didn't have enough sandbags. We didn't have enough time to get them to people, right? So we just kind of targeted a few areas, specifically downtown businesses, right, or downtown um, buildings, right at the uh, storm drains, right at the. Um, at the church and the funeral home, right, and then Elm Street, that was the, kind of the focus for us of trying to get sandbags out there. Um, and again, there is definitely a lot more to do, and you know, we even heard you know, folks talking about that at the July 29th meeting, ideas that they have for that. Um, the, uh, there's lots of comments around how useful text my gov is going to be, right, <laughs> for the people who are familiar with it. Right, so that is kind of people are excited about about the opportunity there. Um, there's what well, you'll see the mobile supply trailer, which you know had come up. Tom um, and Mike Daisy had discussed that a couple of weeks ago. Definitely preparing folks in advance. I will say again, we did more of this in August. We had a longer run up to that storm, which ultimately missed us. But the piece that we had in August was the daily the twice daily reports from um, the National Weather Service in Burlington that included direction like clear culverts now. You know, like that was the, the Monday, the Tuesday, the Wednesday, you know, so that kind of information um, is 
runs through the emergency management stream. It doesn't come out to the regular public. And so I know Tom had mentioned he wasn't getting it regularly. Like that stuff that we would love to see improvement on from the state side. Because they do, they are giving specific direction to municipalities within this communication stream, right? And, and they were very focused on culverts and debris, you know, for August. I didn't see the same level in July, of course, but maybe they weren't thinking that streams were full of material. I think we know now that they were full of material. But that kind of um, free planning, information sharing, right, really, really important focus. And then, um, you know, yeah, so someone- I can just interject, yeah. I, mean, I think in fairness, uh, the, the manner in which the water came down in July was a tremendous amount of water very quickly that carried a lot of debris right into those culverts. So whether or not there was stuff already in those culverts, we could debate, but I think a lot, a lot of it was just the force of that water bringing debris right into areas that couldn't handle it. Both, I think, right? Like this, that, that there was stuff in the streams for sure, you know, because we we know we've had to spend the, you know, Ned Swanberg has talked about this, other folks have talked, there was not a lot of debris clearing between July, December, next July. Like it just kind of was not a big, a big focus, and the state was not telling people to do it, kind of. Um, but yeah, no, that was a, rain intensity is, is certainly a factor. Uh, and, and just in preparation for, for this meeting, I was reviewing our notes, so we actually had a meeting in here on the 10th of, uh, to, of July, uh, and talked about the storm, and at that time, it was 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, we were predicting two to three inches of rain in Central Vermont. Uh, that night, we received a lot of it was well over that, uh, and uh, we were out of the houses uh, by 3 o'clock the next day. Mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, absolutely, right. And the, so the, the, you know, I have a note there, like one of the last um, bullets on preparation and suggestions is something we've talked about it, it that for you all, you know, and, and Tom and the emergency management, you know, folks to decide if we believe that the river gauges are low, then we need to say that publicly, right? And say, the forecast thinks it's gonna be this, our historic trend has been, the forecast has been off by X, right? That's a key, you know, the public communication one is where I think a lot of folks said it was really helpful. I think there's a lot of upside opportunity for us, you know, as a community to continue finding ways to say to people, do this at this point, do that at that point. Um, and both of that lives a lot in the preparedness world around how we train people to behave differently, you know, and then um, how do we decide as a community to say it is time to evacuate or whatever they say in Moortown, prepare to be ready to evacuate, right, a couple steps ahead of that. And I think just to anchor this exercise, like the goal is not placing blame. And to me, it's really like it's capturing what happened in this instance, like good, bad, ugly. I think I will say personally, reflecting on July 2023 to July 2024, like there were things that changed. We had a Facebook page for the town this time. Yes, and, and so we saw that come out in some of the feedback. So I think, you know, the bullets folks are seeing here are like individual anecdotal responses. We had, you know, 10 or so folks who filled out the Google form. but. I think the, the final synthesis kind of in the next steps is that combination of like objective fact, river gauge hit X, we had this level of impact in the town, and then also again what systems had been in place. And again, just personally thinking about it, there is things that were different in 2023, I would say like versus 2024 in both directions across a lot of different topics. So it really is the like, maybe things were faster. We did have a meeting earlier last time or, you know, this time, you know, the meeting on the corner of uh, Elm Street happened <laughs> sooner this time. So I think those are some of the things, if it feels like there's important pieces to capture in subsequent drafts. Um, again, this was kind of phase one. Okay. Um, I agree with everything you just said, Alyssa. Um, and I think this exercise is great. And the anecdotal evidence, it, it's repeated by lots of folks who, who at least I spoke to um, in the affected areas, both in the hinterlands and downtown. Mm -hmm. The first one was, why weren't we warned? I heard that from a, the first, the first thing I heard from a dozen people was, why weren't we warned? 
you know, and and I personally remember being on the phone with Alyssa at 11:30 at night, looking at that gauge and being like, their prediction was disastrously wrong, um, and watching watching the gauge spike, and that happened in December, and then that happened last July, and you know, it, in discussions with folks, it's like it's hard to warn you when the federal government doesn't know. You know <laughs> if they are predicting well, one thing and we're seeing another. Uh, and so it, it's a needle that we have to thread, obviously, about not causing a panic, but also making sure that if there is an emergency, that people are ready to go. Yeah. And yeah, so. Yeah, as Liz noted, I mean, there are yeah. intermediate steps. That, right. That we can Absolutely. Yeah. Have your bags packed. We don't know what's going to happen. The history has shown us this. Right. Exactly. And I think, per your point, Roger, just to say defining is really key. Being clear about what we can and can't do right. so that people have the expectation of what is and isn't a reasonable expectation across a variety of fronts because ultimately transparency, I think that was another common theme throughout mm -hmm. comments. Folks said that the communication that was most useful was clear. It was not fear-mongering, but it was also not it's going to be fine. You know, it's tri <laughs> striking that reality of we're just going to be clear and transparent about the information we do and don't know at the certain point. So again, I think lots more we can dig into there. Right. So that was the before piece, right? Like, mm -hmm. especially when all of us didn't know what was going to happen. Right. Um, and, um, you know, and I do want to continue praising, like, the fact that we took all of that and immediately used it again in August. You know, to, to kind of run the second time on sandbags, on communicating with people about the risk, right? On, on trying to help people inform them decision making is 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 pretty great. Um, you know, you I think you all know this as people who are you know get unbelievable amounts of feedback from the community. If you give people the opportunity to say what could be better, they will absolutely <laughs> seize it. You know, and that's what you want, right? But it does it, it's it's a lot. You know. Again, yeah, the short version will come. You know, so let's talk about during, right? I think that piece that Kane is referring to, right, around people felt afterwards they didn't know enough in the middle of the night, mm -hmm. right? Just a really big, like so many assumptions. People were looking at that river gate. It did not look like it was going to go the way it went. People made a lot of decisions based on that, which goes back to our choice. Like we are going to have to decide, as you all, as public officials, like to say. Are we going to say we don't believe this? We want we want to take the conservative route, pack up, you know, or be ready to pack up, you know. Um, the uh, folks were out all night, right? Tons of folks up in all kinds of areas, um, you know. And so there's, I think, there um, not necessarily a lot of awareness by the public, right, of how much work the road crews, you know, do in the middle. You know, and that is something we could certainly tell folks about more. Um, you know, the communications planning around this, um, I think, right, really, this was a question Alyssa and Tane and I had, is if the decision needed to be made to evacuate at midnight, who was prepared to make that? You know, and that's a real question, right? Like the chain of command piece or what have you. You know, whether, and that is, again, not blame, just kind of what's the plan if we get to that, right? Or if, if Woody like can't make it home to a phone or can't right, if some people are driving, if people are not available at the time, you know, um, the, right? We got to be ready for that. So what are what are our criteria for to flipping that switch? Um, there is a, again, this is a little right. Like people should know, except we know all the time there are people here who don't live here or who just moved here or who you know aren't regularly here. They don't know about moving their cars. It is a culture we're going to have to build. <laughs> you know that just this is a constant piece of like living in a town that is a tourist center and living in a um, community that's growing. There's always going to be people who don't know what to do, and so we have to constantly re reiterate what seems obvious to many of us that. You should move your car, and you should have a go bag, and kind of those those pieces. Um, those are some of the really um, highlights. And then the other piece, I think, um, you know, we didn't get to the point where we needed shelters, but you know, the um, I think it was uh, an earlier storm, right? The question about 
what is the shelter plan, especially if we have to shelter for other towns, right? Or if Bolton needs to come here or Duxbury needs to come here, what's our plan for that, right? I think there's some strengthening to be done there. I will just mention, it's on the report, there is a new head of the Vermont New Hampshire Red Cross who is very active, so I think that's gonna be a really positive, um, a positive piece here on kind of standing up a new group of folks who can help staff shelters. Um, and then, uh, um, the, yep. Just, just curious for context. Does anyone know um, if people were sheltered during Irene? There were some people at the school. The school and the church were both open during uh, Irene. Yeah. Uh, it didn't, as I recollect, it was a handful. Okay. Maybe 10 or so. There were a bunch of people at the church. Okay. Right. So uh, I felt like that was a... Um, yeah, that's more of a we didn't school, go. That's, <laughs> that's, that's where people met. We were advised. School. How many people were um, okay. staying in shelters during Irene? The school was the, was the hub yeah. for, for it. And the it was even like in the days after the school was closed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There is an Irene after action written by some UVM students, so I'm sure we can go dig it up <laughs> after <laughs> this. <laughs> <That's a good laughs> <question>. <laughs> Um, and then, um, you know, kind of, I'm just going to kind of click to the high points. There are lots and lots of ideas and suggestions. Um, just what has already been raised around training people in leadership roles, um, paying them to do that. Um, we, at Crew, we had a mobile app for inputting information about home. Um, kind of getting that to the next level, right, software that whether it's crisis cleanup, which we did not use, but um, there's, you know, options where people who are helping out in neighborhoods can kind of quickly get access to information about the neighborhood and the home. Um, kind of formalizing the response, roles and responsibilities and communicating, I mean, we had a, um, a list from the very beginning of things we could, you know, next time things, right, including canceling events in this room, knowing that if this is going to be the hub of operations, that we know that first intensity definitely lasts, you know, three weeks plus, um, and making sure that that is communicated kind of around to all the um, community organizations and their partners. Um, Definitely, like more advanced planning, as um, you know, Matt was talking about for the Natural Disaster Preparedness Committee, making sure that we have supplies. Like this is a really um, big takeaway for me, right? The state has supplies, many of them, but they aren't available quickly, and also they're only available via the emergency management route. So anyone running the response for the town, it's still only Gary or Tom who can call the State Emergency Operations Center and request anything. Um, no one is ever gonna need to buy PPE ever, right, because the state has so much, but it is a lot of different working to get your hands on it, right? We had to buy buckets because there weren't any, because they all go out to people, and of course you don't necessarily ask for them back. You know, so there's kind of a lot of consumable materials, like gloves, like things that, again, I believe the state has them available. It's just, is when it's crunch time, you can't get your hands on them, you know, because um, it's crunch time for a lot of towns. So that's something, you know, the supply management um, is, is, and staging supplies is really something that I think um, we can keep getting better at. And then, um, as you guys have talked, and I think are going to continue talking, is making budgeting this into the, your annual budget for the town around what is the, what are the expectations about how much do we have to spend that won't be reimbursable or what have you. Um, and then the um, kind of from the standpoint of within the managing the responsibilities, connecting with volunteers versus connecting with flood affected folks, right? Kind of needs more hands. I mean, that was the biggest, we knew that, right? That, that crew needed more hands, for sure, um, to, to organize that. Alyssa, is there stuff you would like to say here? There's just so many little bits. No, there's so much. I was just gonna say, I'm scrolling through with apologies to the folks online, because it's probably nauseating. Um, 
But I think the big piece is like really this is the 18 page full litany of everything. I think uh, synthesis will be more helpful. Um, but thank you to everyone who weighed in. I think you really hit the high points, Liz. I think, um, again, really my takeaway is what I said earlier around there was big improvements between 2023 and 2024. There was also learning, having been a year out from 2023 and December 2023. Um, we just have more information now, like Liz is getting at state supply chains, things that we didn't know before. So I think it's figuring out how we wrap this all up into next steps, which just to say, I think relates to a lot of the other items on our agenda. Um, again, whether it's the preparedness handbook and that, having input from crew, um, and then us as a select board and a town thinking about the resources that we move forward with um, to kind of implement next steps. Just just to note, um, Liz had mentioned the, the river cage and mm -hmm. you know, how we basically, you know, on Facebook and kind of in our own minds, we all seem to have a three foot rule because they've been off by three feet. Mm -hmm. I've tried to get my hands on the old data. Like it'd be great to have, you know, 10 years of actual versus forecast to see. Because um, <coughs> three feet in flood terms is an awful huge difference. Yeah. Um, and we simply, you know, it's almost like it's, it's so inaccurate, it almost can't be a part, it's the only thing we have, but it's such an accurate tool that it, it's almost, it can't be a part of our planning at the same time. It'd just be interesting to know um, how many New York crests have we had? where if we tell the public every time and we had three feet, are we in fact warning the public 20 times a year? And then as a count, then does it not have the right effect? Just trying to get my hands on the data. So far, I've been unsuccessful to try to figure that out. But I mean, we must have hit 420 feet a half dozen times in the past year. But uh, well, do you know the office that uh, provides that over the gauge forecast? Um, so, so the actual um, methodology behind it was actually developed by Roy Schiff and SLR years, years ago after Irene when they did their study. So I'm hoping maybe, you know, some better data we can, you know, some better forecasting can be a little more accurate in the future. But um, I forget who it's all through. I think it might be USGS. Actually. It's, a, it's a partnership between USGS and the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. <coughs> And so I guess one of them has to have it. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not right. necessary. It might not necessarily be saved anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> and I guess I would say, I'm here on a pre like, if we can get the data awesome, I think either way, we don't have any standard, whether it's right. too stringent or not stringent enough as a standard is like a policy choice we can make. Maybe, you know, we start and say we're doing, you know, 420 plus three or whatever. And people, we can be clear and transparent about that would be my recommendation and be clear and transparent about this is based on whatever data we do or do not have. But again, <coughs> operating from not having that type of notification right now, it feels like at least any standard would yeah. you know, be a step forward. Yeah. And what we do know is the standard is, is plus, it's never minus. Right. Right. <coughs> Any other questions or suggestions, comments, additions people want to make? Um, I know you didn't get a lot of time with the document. No, I thought it was great. Uh, it's very comprehensive, and I appreciate all the time you, you took going through it and then putting it together. Uh, any uh, thoughts about uh, a more succinct version uh, with, with, the, with the key findings? In terms of the timeline? I would say maybe two weeks. Right, I don't think it can be faster than that. I'm just going over my head. <laughs> no, that's, no, that's fine. Right. I'm just, uh, just trying to get through that. Um, and if you wouldn't mind staying here, we're going to cover uh, the town <coughs> flood expenses, but then we'll be coming up to crew and future floods. So uh, we'll be calling up on you. I mean, put in a few extra steps. Even though they didn't get any warning, I do just want to say, I think. It, yeah. Right. No, and this it's is clearly in an ideal world we would have had some head up. Yeah. Right. Like we, we, I mean, we got a couple of crew members here, but we did, would have to have a board meeting for any. Right. Right. Yeah. Well, this is just a conversation. Go ahead. Uh, unless there's uh, other questions for Liz right now on this, uh, we'll move on to uh, flood expenses, uh, particularly uh, expenses. 
Sure, I just wanted to put together the rundown of, of where we are as of today, plus give some estimating about um, what's coming. I think the road crew has gotten me a couple little exceptions, little things to do still, but more or less all their staff time. And that goes into, you know, the, the, the Henry Huff and Blush Hill and the emergency measures and the debris cleanup and all those things. So I've got actual time, actual labor costs plugged into this. I've also got equipment costs, which are part of it. Um, the equipment reimbursement rates in FEMA are actually pretty generous, um, usually higher than the labor rates, um, which I guess makes sense if you're, you know, using a $200,000 truck, the hourly rate's pretty good. So this is, uh, the top ones are costs as of today, and then the expected future are some additional cost. Um, <coughs> what yes. was Laurel Road that's going to be higher than anybody else? Um, that was where the, the, the road essentially was, was sloughing off. So we were, we were losing the road. Road. So yeah, that was, that was armoring the bank. Um, and there's a lot of yardage of material um, added there to stabilize the bank. Um, same thing happened on Stowe Street. <coughs> um, Greg Hill is still still waiting on the culvert, but we're we're still thinking that project will be done around the end of the month. We thought that a month ago. Um, <coughs> and the other repair and debris. Are we again with that culvert? Um, that's the that's the one that's bent. The, the big hundred hundred foot long culvert that's bent. You had a replacement when you know? We we have a replacement. We thought it was available. There's a delay in the manufacturing. Yeah. Contractor is ready to go as soon as it's here. So as as the last date we had after it was revised was the culvert will be available September twentieth. Um, I don't know what day of the week that is offhand. Um, but give or take a few days um, for us to get everything in place and for the contractor to work, and we're hopeful end of the month it's all it's all set. <coughs> um, and Shaw Mansion, I think Chris is actually doing that one. Yeah, most <coughs> so. of the time. Actually, we're in the pit right now, <coughs> uh, pulling material out for that. You have an estimate of when that's going to be done. Pardon? You have an estimate when that will that will be done. Should take me three days, you know, three good days. Okay. Uh, yeah, it'll be done. If I don't get started on it late this week, it'll be next week sometime. Okay. <coughs> um, and then the other repair, the other repair is on debris cleanup. You know, we don't have the bill for the dumpster yet, for example. Some of those things just take time. Um, the non-reimbursable is, is essentially what I've learned from the July 2023 flood, which is that um, anything to, <coughs> FEMA reimbursed us for the dumpster expenses. They considered that part of the debris cleanup, but they did not reimburse us, and they will not reimburse us for any volunteer hours or any expenses related to cleaning up inside individual homes or mold prevention. So that's the, that's the tough one. Um, they've been pretty steadfast in that. Maybe a different storm, different FEMA rep, I can make a different argument, but, but that was all rejected in, for the 2023. Um, and talking to other towns, they had the same, same issue. Um, so that's around 10 um, right now, and I think those costs are, are fairly firm. So in the end, after... Um, after what I believe FEMA will reimburse us for the costs above, and then they throw in um, the very end, and this is the very, very end, so this is probably 18 to 24 months from now, we would get a 5% administrative reimbursement, which is really for all my time doing with the claim. <coughs> so a net impact to the town, about 115. The, the, the other part that's interesting is within that 115, um, all our labor costs that we get reimbursed for were budgeted, so we're not really out of pocket. We would have spent it anyway. We just spent it on flood recovery and not things like Guptill Road. Um, and the same with the equipment costs. That's reimbursement that was not budgeted. Obviously, the equipment is not free, 
um, but nonetheless, it's a it's almost like that that's a little bit of a boom, uh, if you will, to get to get the reimbursement for the equipment. Um, but 115 is is the rough number. Um, I think just having gone through the 2023 claim, I think that's reasonably firm. They um, they pick apart every number um, and they go through every claim in detail. Some of them are quite easy. When there's a contractor and a bill for 90 grand and a project, that's an easy one. Um, they tend to spend a little more time on, on things like the labor costs um, and staff documentation, but they they generally accept your word that, in fact, if you've got timesheets that say, you know, this crew member wasn't Henry Huff all day, they accept that. And we've got that documentation in spades. So I think this is pretty pretty solid. Um, and I don't think there's any costs that are gonna surprise us at this point. Questions, Melissa? Um, just to follow my path in terms of where you're getting that 115, obviously it's including non-reimbursable and then for reimbursable it's 75%, is that yeah. correct? That's so essentially 75. that's the 25% of all of the expenses and 100% of the non-reimbursable. Yeah. That's correct. And all this, you know, even the reimbursable part comes back to us quite a long time from now. Yeah, oh yeah, no, recognizing after the fact, just in terms of per year, note specifically about document labor and town equipment, we are getting some, you know, that cost is for some new infrastructure, which yes, we didn't, <laughs> might not have been budgeted and we certainly um, have to pay a share of, but a smaller share. Ian, um, Tom, I just want to go back to um, those non-reimbursable expenses. Um, you mentioned those for volunteer hours specific to the Yeah, we, we had, we had, th we had well, those weren't an expense to us, but we had, um, <coughs> we had hoped to get volunteer hours. Reim FEMA will reimburse for volunteer hours, right. so they will reimburse us for debris cleanup. Debris cleanup, volunteer. They will not reimburse for the work done inside the homes for things like mold prevention. Because, and their, their explanation is that is an individual assistance matter, not a public assistance matter. So that's where they that's where they draw the line. Um, so we had a lot of volunteer hours in 2023 related to debris cleanup. Yeah, that we're hoping to get reimbursed for. Um, so there's still some hope for that. There's some hope for future. Um, not, some hope for the 2024 funds too. But yeah, the the mold prevention, which is a big part of crew's work, unfortunately, is just not not something that we can draw down funds for. Which would be great because there's no town expense of that labor, then it would be a great crew could get that money if we could right. draw it down on their behalf. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. Thank you. But just to be yeah. clear, there's a difference between not being able to draw down funds and having the town have an expense. The town right. doesn't Correct. have an expense for volunteers doing things we're not paying them for, which we have not paid them for. <laughs> And is there a line drawn, uh, as far as Kim is concerned, about uh, what is reimbursable debris cleanup? Because there's any number of yards of debris still sitting along the banks of the Winooski uh, from the flood, but uh, I don't know if it's a, a town problem. Um, all our debris was dumpster related. Okay. You know, we, we did clean up and, you know, we were, we were under the bridges right here for a while, but all that we just shipped down stream for the most part. Other questions?
So I just uh, wanted to open up uh, the floor for uh, what uh, people may have in mind uh, for preparing for the next time when we get a warning that, say, Hurricane Francine has uh, got its eyes set on Vermont. We're not prepared to have that conversation. We okay. haven't had it among ourselves. Uh-huh. Okay. Right? I mean, I had asked what this agenda item was about when it came out, and I didn't get an answer. So I don't, you know, like, we didn't... Okay. We don't well, that's, that's fine. Uh, you know, and I, I can't say that I'm prepared to answer it myself, but I have the responsibility of asking the question. I think they like got a lot of preparedness suggestions, right? Who implements them is like a question, right? The 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 whether crew at this moment has the resources to muster volunteers for sandbagging, you know, what have you. I mean, it's a lot of empty basements, so right this minute, just as there were, you know, last early September. Um, but in terms of being able to mobilize people to go do that, which is the number one community chore, right, is sandbagging. That's kind of our only thing. Um, what we mostly did for August was to, you know, request Tom and Woody to make them available mm -hmm. and to send out information to people that they were available. Right, we send, you know, like a lot of emails that we for flash flood warnings and um, sandbagging, and we would do that again for sure, you know, if the if the materials were available. But in terms of what would a plan be for uh, the response portion, if we were to get hit again, I'm going to say we don't have we have no idea right now. Well, that conversation also involved the preparedness committee. I mean, that feels like a more productive conversation to have every group involved in deciding what happens next. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, I mean, as it stands, I don't, I don't think the crew has the capacity to perform the next flood response or energy. Mm -hmm. Really? Okay. <coughs> appreciate that. Yeah. I was just uh, clarifying question. Um, I guess when you asked, I, I am confused as to if it is an in-the-moment call for evacuation or if it is flood recovery. Like, as we, as we spoke of in the last agenda item, the after-action report, is if it's midnight and the numbers have spiked past <coughs> the estimate mm -hmm. and someone has to make a call for evacuations, who that is or, or are we talking about? Are, are we talking about in-the-moment response or post-flood response? Well, uh... I think both, but um, the, uh, we can take them one at a time. Um, in terms of the determination of whether we evacuate in which uh, neighborhoods we evacuate, I believe that that's the uh, emergency uh, uh, director of emergency management, which is a fire chief. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I don't believe he has the legal authority to force evaluate evacuation. Right. Right. But he did, let's say, during Irene, he's the one that made the call and had the fire department go door to door, uh, at least on the off, and I expect uh, other uh, neighborhoods as well. And they knocked on the doors and said, it's time to go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay. Okay. Cheryl? Cheryl? Yes, um, hi. So uh, my comment kind of goes into the next agenda, item, but I think it comes into mitigation a little bit. So I wanted to um, bring a proposal to the board, um, and it's really on the next agenda item, but it plays into the mitigation and what we're talking about right now. Uh, I would really like to propose to the town board that 100% of the local option tax at this time and probably hopefully for the next couple of years goes into the infrastructure of this town. Uh, uh, we know that our budget has not planned for a lot of the things that have been happening and that have happened and that have to be repaired, rebuilt, and also to provide preventative maintenance moving forward. Um, I, I think it would be more fiscally sound 
as a town at this time, if we took those monies that are coming from that option tax and put aside 100% to these mitigation efforts, repairing, rebuilding, and making our town safe for everybody that lives here. I know that there's been talk about, you know, dividing it in thirds, and I understand that, um, but there's a lot of things that we didn't plan for in our budget that we've also talked about tonight. There's a lot of things in our budget that we need to plan for in the future. Um, and I would ask that when you're talking about mitigation and working forward on all these things that we need to protect the town, that that's taken into consideration. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Appreciate your uh, suggestion. Um, so uh, I think in terms of the evacuation, uh, that would be uh, a consideration uh, that we, we talk or discuss, uh, make sure that we all have clarity about that decision and how it gets made uh, with Gary. Um, and then uh, the second half of your question was uh, about uh, being prepared for the recovery efforts, um, and I think that's still a bit of an open one. Um, and, but yeah, there are a number of suggestions in the after action review, uh, which we can take into consideration, maybe bring us up even at our next meeting, which will be next week. Um, and uh, we may not have more answers to that just now. Roger, do you mind if I ask a stupid question? Um, depends on how stupid I am. Right? <laughs> I'm sitting here listening to the conversation about how we deal with this when it happens again, how we deal with this and that, and I've listened to it for years. And I'm thinking to myself, I don't have the time, I wish I had the time, I'd love to take the time to figure out how the water's getting into these houses and how to stop it, I guess. Mm -hmm plain terms, uh, we can put submarines in the water to prevent water, you know, water doesn't come in. Uh, we can put people on the moon, we can do all kinds of things, but we can't stop a simple flood water from coming into a house. It, it boggles my mind. If we could achieve that, all of this other stuff is moot. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I don't know how the water is getting in. Is it is it groundwater coming in? Is it surface water from actual floodwaters coming in? Is it coming in through the doors? Is it coming in through the walls? Is it coming in through the stone foundations? How is it coming in? And what's the smartest, simplest, easiest way to stop it from some form of the <coughs> treatment of the building up so high, either from the outside or from the inside? Uh, you know, a simple thing that comes to mind was my sister-in-law's house that she bought off my cousin there that died from fentanyl. She had basement dewatering systems come in and, because there was always water in the basement, mm -hmm. and with the last flood she didn't have any because they came in and did their thing. What was it about what they did that stopped the water from coming in? And is there other advances beyond that that would protect these homes from that type of infiltration of water, if you could achieve that, special doors, you know, entrance mm -hmm. entrance doors that seal water tight. Uh, how is the water getting in, and you know, what what is a simple solution to stop it? Because the aggravation that you people have to go through every time this happens is unsustainable. I don't know how you. you a lot rougher on the homeowner, Chris. Oh, but no. you know that I think. But this is a perfect plus for what we really want to spend our time on, which is we will be doing a workshop, um, a community conversation. We don't have a date yet, um, but sometime later this month, where people can come and talk about, including your sister-in-law. These are the things I did that work, because there are a lot of people who have made a lot of improvements that led to them having less water. And we want folks to come and share those ideas because it's really mm -hmm. important for us to learn from each other. It is different. It is every kind of water, right? Like you go look at Peter O'Brien's mother's house, right? Nothing she could have done, you know, to prevent what happened there. 
you know, there's a foundation hole that's like the size of this room, right? But the, um, there is, the flash flooding is a different scenario than groundwater flooding or inundation flooding, and there are answers property-wise for every one of them. So the flash flooding, which is stormwater management uphill and clearing debris out of the streams. Like those are the only things, right? But crew's real mission is make the lists and identify all the things that property owners can do and things on the individual level, on the collective level that we can do. This is what we're really focused on, helping people get the resources they need, <coughs> you know, to build back better and then helping us all learn what mm -hmm. does better look like. Have right? you set a date for that? Uh, no, I gotta um, close the loop um, with Gary working about doing it at the fire station. Mm -hmm. um, but that is one of the many kind of things we have on our agenda around stuff we want people to share. A lot of folks have made some great improvements. Right. And, um, you know, there are kind of a lot of things between um, just, uh, you know, doing better gutters to elevating your homes. Okay. You know, and that is just like that's people. So we should be talking a lot more about gutters. I want to say it's really important, you know, and um, and there's some some educational resources out there. We're looking to bring some folks in to talk about these are the kinds of things you could be doing on your property. You know, this is a big priority for us. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, I mean, I feel like Curry has kind of become known as the one to respond to the floods immediately, which we have. But I mean, for the past year, we've been trying to also prioritize the individual mitigation. <coughs> projects people can do and learning more about them and all of that, but with the three floods, you, know, you can't really have you balance that work. And so the more you respond to floods, the harder it is to think long-term mitigation strategies. Um, but that's really like what we kind of started this group for, long-term help and case management for folks from last summer and December, but ultimately like prioritizing the mitigation strategies, individual level strategies for everybody. So we want to do more of that work for sure. Right. Okay. Oh, okay. Fire station's a good idea. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. right. for sure. Snacks. <laughs> <laughs> you always have snacks. <laughs> All right, if we uh, want to table this, this particular agenda item, uh, we can and uh, move on to mitigation. But if uh, someone has a question, uh, I just wanted to add one final. Um, piece of input to this agenda item. Um, we've sat around this table dozens of times talking about the same mitigation efforts and the same what people do to their homes. We've had the same conversation a dozen times. Um, and we keep getting hit with floods faster than we can respond to them in, in any sort of longevity. Um, we've heard simple solutions uh, that aren't so simple, right? Uh, widening the river. In theory, that's simple. In practice, it's not. And then before we can execute those things, we get hit with another flood. So before we go into this conversation next time, I think we need to keep those things in mind, that we are responding to something before it happens, but we are not doing a full, we're not taking the full preventative steps that we're going to need to be taking if we're going to get hit before we can take those steps if that makes any sense. So essentially we're putting band-aids on dams. Well, yeah, um, <laughs> I think, you know, there has been a lot of learning, um, and, which is not always fun. Uh, but uh, the, I think there are measures that we can take. Uh, Liz has just offered us 18 pages of them. Right. Uh, and, uh, small steps that can be taken to minimize the amount of damage, right? Uh, based on what we know and what we, what we think we can expect. Uh, meanwhile, we are gonna be talking about mitigation at larger scale issues about what can be done to protect the entire town uh, to the extent possible. So I think it does help to sort of segment this between immediate recovery, yeah. making sure, uh, saving lives, uh, immediate recovery, uh, longer term recovery, and then uh, long term mitigation. 
May I ask a question? Yeah, sir. It's a topic um, for Tom to, so I do a lot of work with FEMA in my job with VTrans, and they usually reimburse for any costs upstream and downstream of 200 feet of a structure. Is there a mechanism where maybe um, crew could volunteer or organize volunteers to do some of that preventative debris clearing within those FEMA eligible limits that then could be captured as a reimbursement cost to provide budget for crew once it's recaptured? Um, I know sometimes there's a, a you know a certain period of time for eligibility and, and whatnot for those responses, but I think if if we have a mm -hmm. theme of point of contact, that's something we could do right now. We could organize volunteers to do some debris clearing upstream, downstream, and then potentially um, reimburse those costs to have them repurposed, you know, mm -hmm. in the future. That's a great question. Um, I'll try to check in with them. I don't have a FEMA rep assigned to me yet. This latest flood, but I do know for the state projects that that's the, the, the cutoff reimbursement, but I'm not sure if that's the same one for the <coughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Good question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So Tom will follow up. Thank you. All right. Let's move forward. Um, Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks Thank a lot. I appreciate it. Um, mitigation update. Um, we have the, the hazard mitigation grant free application uh, was submitted before the August 30th deadline. Um, the bulk of that is for the updated hydrology study, which will give us real information we need to hopefully identify some some projects of storage, which mm -hmm. is which is the end game here, I think, in a big way. Um, I'll talk about that for a second in light of the email that came out about hiring the grants manager. I did offer that job um, as a consultant to a different person, actually Friday, so I'm waiting to have some further conversation, but people have to realize is that um, there is no grant, there is no project yet. The, the hydrology study is what will, we hope, give us some projects, but until there's, you know, opportunities that are identified through the hydrology to actually store water, create floodplain then we don't really have um, a whole lot to work on, to be quite frank. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's part of the challenge here is we want to have someone ready to go to assist. But if the hydrology study essentially tells us what it did a decade ago, which is it's that piece of property is the, is the beginning and the ending, um, then it may not be a long-term position because there just may not be that much opportunity for, for storage and floodplain creation. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are going to be some opportunities because I think going further up the brooks is going to be a substantial game changer for us. Um, but I just want to make sure people understand that context. And just in terms of the timing of the hydrology study, uh, you're looking to use LIDAR data? They use much, yep. and they've, they've got to reach the ground, so there's got to be leaves off the trees. Um, interestingly enough, they can penetrate water, but not leaves. <coughs> and then that should be, um, <coughs> you know, essentially wrapped up um, around the end of the year. And then from that, um, the consultant says, is once you have your base modeling done, you can do a bit of plug and play with different scenarios to see what might give you some uh, some flood mitigation. Mm -hmm. And then once we have those scenarios, those are the real projects we want to get the grants for because those are going to be multi-million dollar. Uh, no matter what, I mean, if you think about, you know, if, if we identify the state cornfield, for example, as a viable project, you know, we're taking off thousands of yards of fill. It's not a not a free proposition to do that. So that's where we really need the grant help. Mm -hmm. And do you want to mention uh, the conversation that we had with uh, the uh, commissioner of uh, <coughs> buildings and general services? Yes. So we, we did talk to the state about the cornfield, and um, I stated to her that I think it might be. Uh, so first off, she is. That department is applying for FEMA funds to get rid of the the, the buildup that's occurred from the last shoe flood. So they, they're hoping to get FEMA to pay for that and to do that anyway. Um, 
but the commissioner so building and general services. And that was just for clarification's <coughs> sake. Uh, that would be after they harvest the corn. Yeah, scraping off. They would the, scrape off the accumulated silt. Um, but we also <coughs> you have to <laughs> determine what is accumulated silt in that field because it's also. Well, they're hoping they've got lidar data from the last flood study from a decade ago, and they can use that as a base uh -huh. and return to that base. Good one. Um, but we also said that I think it makes sense for the town of Waterbury to own that field long term because we can control our destiny a little better. Anything we do, I think, will we'll protect the state complex so there's no risk on their end to doing it. Um, and she seemed enthusiastic and, and agreeing. Um, there's a I believe it's a rule, not a law, that the state has to sell property at market value, but she even said she'd suspend, she, she'd suggest suspending that rule because it's not a whole lot of market value anyway. Um, and it's not a piece of property the state that would ever develop. Um, so from their perspective, um, they're willing to give it to us. I mentioned that also to our two state reps, and I think it's a matter of what bill it's put in and, and how soon it can happen. Not all that simple. We want to do some environmental studies, make sure there's nothing there that's going to result in a $10 million liability to the town, that sort of thing. But if we can own the field, I think we can control our destiny a little better. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to ask if it is the state's intention, as, as they um, would like to remove whatever silt they perceive is on top of that cornfield. Um, if, <coughs> if they're enthusiastic about granting us that piece of property so that it is our problem instead of theirs. <coughs> Which is not necessarily a problem if we can take care of it ourselves, but if that's, if that's why they came to that conclusion. <laughs> I think given their awareness of, of how it it does have some impact on Randall and Elm, especially, even if it's not dramatic in terms of flood water, but it's certainly psychological, and that's important too. Right. Um, so I think that, you know, even if we don't own it, they have heightened awareness of it now, and, yeah. and we'll make sure they stay aware of it. But I just think we're more nimble. We can, we can you know, so it comes in there, we can get it back to, to the old grade faster than I can. Mm -hmm. And uh, I did just also want to mention that uh, last, at the last meeting we had a question from a uh, resident at O'Hare Court uh, wanting to know if uh, the town was doing anything to remove the debris from underneath the Armory Drive and uh, Main Street bridges. And uh, I understand the town went in there with chainsaws and took out everything that's removable from underneath there. <coughs> and the other piece I want to mention that wasn't in the hazard mitigation pre-app, it's been, I think, a topic of chatter um, here and there, but um, I think there's some opportunity to lessen the challenge in the future through a stormwater ordinance. That's, um, no, that's not necessarily the easiest ordinance to write. You're impacting private landowners. Um, it's relatively easy to regulate new development, um, but if you've got to regulate existing development and impose a cost on landowners, that's a pretty difficult ordinance and a difficult conversation, but I do think that there's some positive work to be done there. Um, you know, our culverts clogged up and flooded, and in a number of cases, so did, so did ones on private roads and, and private ditches and, and spilled over into our roads. Um, you know, a number of issues arose, I think, with storm retention ponds. Um, so I just think that's an area that could bear some fruit, but it's not easy. In fact, I think it's quite, quite complex. Yeah, also. I guess just building on that, I do have to say, I think the impression that we don't need to hire staff until this one particular grant is ready to be written. Like, I just recognize you have the skill set. There's a skill set to writing a 424 when we're doing that particular grant, but I think per what you just said about stormwater, I, I do think maybe at our next meeting we need to think about, you know, we have a municipal planner. I know they're busy with the planning commission. The planning commission's doing a lot of work, but I just think the only way to address flood mitigation is not a FEMA 
hazard mitigation grant. You know, we have, we could be applying for a municipal planning grant to do a comprehensive stormwater evaluation. We could have someone take some of the ordinance writing work and research off of your plate, Tom, recognizing that there's a whole lot of authority that only you have as the manager. Um, there's this communications <coughs> and public input piece. There's shopping around ideas to neighbors so that they're really interested in. There's coordinating with career. I just feel like Kane made the point of, we have these discussions a lot, and to be honest, as someone going through 17 pages of input at 12.40 p.m. on a Saturday, yes, that's when I was giving comments to Liz. Like, I think we do need to think really seriously. You know, we've heard now from both of the main committees that are involved in this work for this town about the need for staff capacity, and I just think um, I appreciate hearing that someone was offered a position and think we, we need to move forward with some more capacity, which is not a critique on any current staff. Current staff is doing so much, but there's more to be done, and I think seeing that there's real costs to the municipalities when we don't do this, it would be really proactive to have someone looking at this up front. Likely, we hopefully will get a lot of their work covered by grants in the future, but I think it's a short-term expense we need to have to kind of get some of this moving. So I just don't think waiting until we're at the final application <coughs> is correct or appropriate. Anything else on your, your plate, Tom? <laughs> Any other questions, comments? All right, thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, next item is the uh, division of the local option tax allocation. And uh, we did uh, discuss this uh, in conjunction with the uh, creation of the um, housing trust. Uh, yes, housing trust fund. Um, and I think at that time, Alyssa uh, brought up the fact that uh, in passing the uh, local option tax, uh, we uh, agreed that there would be four primary buckets that uh, would be, that the fund would be used for. And so I went back and took a look, and my understanding is that uh, that would be the uh, one the payment of uh, uh, public debt, or town debt, mm -hmm. uh, capital uh, expenses, uh, economic development, and community vitality, uh, including housing, and then uh, municipal investments to guarantee uh, long-term safety. I don't have a different understanding of the uh, of where we uh, indicated that that funding would go uh, when we passed the uh, that uh, charter change. Okay. Sorry, Roger. I'm sorry. Will you repeat them one more time quickly? Sure. Just the first one. <laughs> Point, sir, or are we done? Are you guys? Uh, Cheryl is asking a question. Just a moment, Cheryl. Yeah, Cheryl, I'm just trying to clarify for the record uh, what was in, what was passed uh, for the charter <coughs> uh, and how the use of that money, right? Ah, okay, thank you. Sure. Um, so, uh, Payment of uh, the town debt was one. Uh, capital expenses was two. Economic development uh, and community vitality, including housing initiatives. And four was uh, municipal investments to guarantee long-term savings. And efficiencies. And for those online, they're in the November 6, 2023 informational meeting about the creation of the charter. And Tom obviously included this in his testimony to the legislature to ultimately get a, to approve the charter. Yeah, I guess that wasn't clear that you guys had passed that in November. I thought it was just discussion of. Uh, I, 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 so I, I, I ask, is there a way to ask for you guys to amend that decision or no? 
the done deal? Uh, well, I believe that uh, Tom presented that uh, to the legislature uh, in the passage of the uh, charter change. It's not part of the it's charter. Not part of the charter. Yeah, it's, it's not part of the charter, but it was described as our intent uh, at the time, right? Right. So I think as Cheryl and those of us who love digging in the minutes observed, we should probably have a more formal motion that I'll make now that those were the four allowable categories, but that has always been our attempt through both public informational meetings and Tom's intent to the legislature was to keep the allowable uses within those four buckets. Um, to your question, Cheryl, beyond that, obviously you can have four buckets and put 0% in three buckets and 100% in another bucket. That could be something that changed year to year. I think our intent in outlining this is that we want it to be give some understanding to the public around what the types of allowable uses for local option tax revenue are, also recognizing that individual select boards in different years might have different priorities each year depending on what comes up. Um, and so that, then again, those would be presented every year as part of the town meeting budget, again, um, for further consideration. Okay, so, so if I'm interested in those are the buckets. Um, and when it comes to town meeting and how we're going to allocate the uh, option tax, that will be decided on town meeting. So if, if somebody recommends that it all goes for infrastructure, which is what we need, right? We have a lot of repairs, rebuilding, future protection projects that we really need to work on, right? Um, is that a way to have that money go to that one bucket? at least for that year or maybe two years so that we can rebuild our, our community, get our community back to where it needs to be, and then we can focus on the other projects. Is that what I'm hearing or did I not hear that? Yes, I think the proposal was there could be a discussion of what the local option tax money would be clearly outlined as a component of the budget, like any component of the municipal budget, and then that could be discussed. So per your point, yes, it could say, here's how it's broken down for various infrastructure projects or various other uses, um, but that would all be future. Mm -hmm. Roger, I'd, yeah. Just, yeah. I'd, just like, okay. I'd just like to clarify, as uh, you brought up alternative understandings, of what we passed. Um, everything that was suggested in my proposal, uh, it was either the last meeting or the meeting before, uh, falls into one of those buckets. Right. right? Infrastructure, uh, vitality, paying mm -hmm. off the debt is literally one of the buckets. <laughs> Problem right now, and that's infrastructure. So I'm just hoping that as you, as the board, move forward fiscally and look at the budget, that you focus on the community and the rebuilding and the repairing and the preventative maintenance that we need to do. So Kane, I appreciate a lot of things that you're working toward, but there's there's some really real, real, really big problems going on right now for the whole community. Things that we didn't expect that were gonna collapse, roads that got washed out, culverts that are no longer existing, uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff that has to be repaired and, and we have to figure out how to make it not happen again. So I'm just concerned. And we have this, this option tax money coming in, so it would be really great if we could use that and, and help the community as a whole. That's all. But, so thank you. All right, thanks, Cheryl. Appreciate your... Uh your suggestions and your comments. Uh, I think the, the issue may be uh, the process uh, and the timing uh, of how we make those decisions uh, and when. Um, and I guess one of the considerations is that uh, we have a certain amount of money coming in uh, this year, this calendar year. Uh, Tom, when do you expect uh, that that funding will be come available? So the, the money is collected quarterly by the state, and then it's about six weeks before they turn it over to us. So, mm -hmm. um, and the auditors recognize the revenue in the year it's which it's paid by the by the people who are making the purchases. So we will get half a year's worth that will impact this year's budget. We won't actually get the first payment until 
middle of November. And then again, it will be the middle of February, but it will be booked to 2024. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, we anticipate getting uh, what could be described as a windfall of uh, perhaps $300,000, $325,000 uh, towards the end of this year that we could make a decision about uh, how that money gets spent uh, and we count towards this current fiscal year. Um, and we've gotten a couple of suggestions. Can you suggest uh, a third for infrastructure, which I mean plays to Cheryl's point as well, um, as she is concerned about our infrastructure uh, culverts, especially with recent flooding. Um, and then a third to paying down debt. Um, there was a presentation that Tom gave a few minutes back about that. Um, and then the third would go to the housing trust to kick off uh, as seed funds for that trust. Mm -hmm. okay. And I'll just note that uh, back in November of last year, we identified uh, three major uh, issues facing the town at that time, uh, which were uh, paving uh, of roads, which is an expensive, always an expensive proposition, uh, public safety, and uh, flood mitigation were three major expenses that the town anticipated facing at that time. Um, so I, th I think we're not far from the discussion that we had uh, almost a year ago. Um, and um, we could also identify other current and potential issues facing us and then uh, maybe we need to make a decision about at what point do we want to make the decision and how. Chris. Um, you got four so-called bucket items. Uh, Chris, can you come up here so people at home sure. can hear you, please? Sure, absolutely. Yeah. You got four bucket items. The first two are, I guess you could say they're pretty basic. Is there any defined outline as to what each one of these buckets entail? Um, the, the trust that Kane speaks of, um, what are the details to that? Is it just money that's just gonna go out and never come back? Uh, is it some type of a revolving fund? Is it a loan? Is, you know, what are the details behind it? Um, and, and how is it going to operate? And uh, is there any monitoring of whether or not these buckets are yielding the return on investment that we'd like to see? And if not, are we going to change it? Do something different, and, you know. I think there needs to be a little bit more detail as to each one of these specific line items, what they entail, so that it just it's not painted with a broad brush, and we're going to you know, really, really use it for this, that, and the other thing, um, mm -hmm. if that's possible. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, other suggestions or comments? I will yeah. argue for the broad brush as just defining something as infrastructure would allow our roads crews to do <coughs> the project and work on it with the allotted funding. Mm -hmm. You know, having that extra, especially this year, not budgeted for money in the coffers of the roads department or the public works department for projects that need to get worked on as as Cheryl has pointed out as well um, I think I think painting with a broad brush makes it easier for those departments to work on the projects that they need to work on instead of p pigeonholing certain expenditures mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and as far as the uh, housing trust is concerned the housing task force uh, the chair of the housing task force has come before us several times 
um, and spoken on this, and we spoke to Down Street about this as well, and what their programs are and how we can help fund them. Um, no, I agree uh, that the broad categories can help. Uh, I also think that uh, asking for a more complete uh, breakdown uh, for how the funding is actually going to be spent is going to be something that uh, taxpayers are going to be expecting. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Tom, I know that you've uh, got a couple of projects in my infrastructure projects in mind and also have talked about uh, paying down the debt. So do you have any further specifics, or would you like some time to come up with specifics? I think it's, um, I think it's best dealt with in the budget um, for 2025. I think if we're talking the, the unbudgeted money this year, I think, um, I think that's also going to interplay with it. Um, I think we've also got to think about um, the flood mitigation piece and, and, and using, I think, local option taxes grant match, which is going to be a likely component of it all. Um, so I think it's um, it's hard to be very specific right now. It's still, um, still a little bit early in the year. I'm, I'm actively working on 2025, but a lot of big decisions being made there. Um, in my mind, too, implicit in all this, not stated, but I think implicit, is that we should make every effort to avoid using it for operational expenses. Mm -hmm. and otherwise, then you're just, you know, it's just going into the wind at some point, and yeah. then it's just a regular line item. It becomes part of the general fund. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And operational expenses were not any of the lines that uh, right. we covered, right? Um, and but at this point, there's no burning project that you have that you could implement uh, this fiscal year that needs money uh, you know, that you think is a priority. You know, the reality is if, if you told me I had another 100 grand for paving, I'm not sure the paving contractors have the time, yeah, right. which is the challenge of this. Mm -hmm. And you know, we've, we've heard from the public tonight about public safety. Um, also, probably not a problem that's going to be solved uh, this, this year. Yeah. Yeah, this year. Okay. Or at least uh, we can throw money at it and, and say we solved it. Um, and I can certainly get you in by next week a list of some smaller infrastructure projects we could probably tackle. Um, because once once paving slows down, you have, depending on the season, you have a time window um, where the contractors might have a little more availability, you know, that, that period around Thanksgiving where it hopefully doesn't snow, ground's not hard frozen, so they can do some work, uh, but they can't pave. Mm -hmm. So I can certainly um, get you a list of smaller projects within a week. That won't be a problem. There's plenty of, plenty of culverts that need work, that, you know, maybe upsizing. Um, there's, there's some gravel road challenges we could deal with, I'm sure, where we have traditional mud spots. We can do some do some work there to uh, shore things up a little better. Okay. I do think that getting more definition on what we might have in mind, what would be a priority, uh, would be helpful. Uh, my understanding is that the housing task force is taking a look at the uh, housing uh, trust fund. Uh, but you can uh, provide any further clarification. Last time we met was uh, about 20 days ago. So. And I, I haven't personally spoken with the Housing Task Force. Maybe Alyssa has, but I won't speak on her behalf. Um, what I will say is that a housing trust exists. We voted it into existence. Right. And you can put money in it and not take money out until you know what you're going to do with it. Mm -hmm. And I think that will that can also sit well with taxpayers as long as they know it's there and not being spent until we know what we're spending it on. But at least it will be there for a project that will arise inevitably. Well, and the uh, VHIP program is one of the things that we identified right. in the point that we're talking with uh, down the street uh, that has opened up. Uh, we've just opened up uh, applications for it. Uh, and we talked about topping up the $50,000 right. Uh, Absolutely. 
So uh, if we had more detail on that, uh, some degree of, uh, uh, of under a better degree of understanding, at least in my mind, as to what the demand for that would be, particularly uh, around developing ADUs uh, or further housing opportunities uh, in Waterbury, I think that would strengthen the case, right? Sure. Okay. Roger. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Cheryl, we've already so let's go to A. Amy Marshall Carney. Okay. Hi there. Sorry. For, for listening to me, and I missed the... Sorry, Cheryl. We, we gave Amy Marshall Carney the opportunity to speak first, so I'm sorry I've muted you. Amy? Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Thank, thank you. you. Sorry, it'll be quick, quick Cheryl. Cheryl. I, was I was just going to say that um, I, I, I was having a hard time hearing um, all of the conversation, but if there was some focus on grants and opportunities relative to watershed, I know that the Waterbury Conservation Commission is looking at that right now, and we have some ideas um, that we're hoping will be in a good position to prepare for uh, sharing with both the Planning Commission and the Select Board in the coming months. That might be helpful for near-term and long-term planning. Okay. All right, thanks. Uh, now back to Cheryl. Yeah, yeah sorry, Amy. I just, I wanted, just wanted to thank, thank the board for your time tonight, tonight and I missed, I missed the, the public, public portion, and, and I wanted to thank whoever is covering up the graffiti. Every time it happens, I just wanted to thank whoever is having to do that. So um, that's that's okay. road crew. Mm -hmm. That's the road crew. Alright. Road crew. Yep. Highway department. Okay. Uh, any other comments tonight about allocation of uh, of uh, LOT funding? Roger, can I read a quick letter that was sent to me um, just to give you an idea of why I'm concerned about where the tax dollars are going. Sure. So this was sent to me a few weeks ago, uh, a couple weeks ago, and it has really <clears throat> kind of hit me hard. Uh, this was from a resident of Waterbury. The American dream, well, it is not for the working person, I can tell you that. I cannot sustain what I have. I have given gave blood, sweat, and tears to have a simple home. As you know, I have a second job as well, still not making the demands of taxes, food, costs, and everything else. Needless to say, I am more than upset. I'll play this game as long as I can. Something must give. I know I won't go down without a fight. Really, what else do I have to lose? It is hard to play the game if it changes every few months, years, who the hell knows? I can see the mo that most, not all, the younger people starting the workforce do not have a clue. I have been trying to train them. We need the help, that is for sure. Thanks again. So this is a, a property owner here in Waterbury who's struggling to stay in his home. Uh, we're taking his tax dollars along with others and using it in a situation, this guy's got a second job. Uh, I could send you the response, I sent that to Teresa Wood and I could send you the, I could read you the response that I put behind it, but I'm not going to. Uh, I don't know if there's, I don't know what the real uh, reasoning for The, the financial end of why people aren't able to come up with the money for first month's, last month's security deposit. Um, I know myself, I was going to bring in my notebooks here tonight. Decades of books that I've had that you could follow my life pretty much every day. There's never been I don't remember the last time I worked 40 hours a week. Mm -hmm. Just don't remember it. That's 
You know, Vermont's a beautiful place to live, but it's a very difficult place to live. I, I recognized that a long time ago. And I said to myself, in order for me to be able to survive here, it's not going to be at 40 hours a week. To, hear, to, to read this guy's letter, knowing that he's struggling to stay in his home, uh, I'm just wondering if everybody else is putting in the same effort that he is to try to have a place to live. I hope that's the case. It's probably not. This work-life balance. And what frustrates me, and I have no clue, a lot of it's surmising, I'm seeing people all the time during the middle of the week jogging down the road, pedal biking, off doing this, off doing that. And I'm thinking to myself, along with others, they say the same thing to me. Does anybody work anymore? Uh, so this guy's letter has really caused me a lot of anxiety because I care about the people that live in this town. And nothing else matters. If you can't stay in your home, nothing else matters. If you can't afford to stay in your home, everything, is, everything else is useless. So, you know, we're coming up against some hard issues. Uh, you know, I got a letter in my pocket that I wanted to read to the governor, or talk to the governor when he came to town there a week ago. Uh, and the list of things that, you know, our state pension programs, $4 billion in the red. Uh, Chris, I hear you, and I do have to say we're close. I don't want, no, and I, no, I appreciate you sharing, and I just want to say, speaking for myself, and I think the whole board, we care about and love Waterbury, and that's why we choose to spend many of our time, I just hours. want to make sure that the money is appropriated in the best possible use, so guys like him can stay in his home. And I think that's what we're all trying to do here tonight, and that's why it takes many conversations. And also, Chris, part of why local option tax was important around having resources that weren't just property tax owners for the town as we try and meet all the demands we have. So it's almost like nothing matters. Nothing else, you know, no matter what we do, is it's not it's not getting us where we need to be. It's, yeah. it's almost like we're we're circling the drain and there's no way out. Because if you keep going after people's paychecks and you're going after their home, I don't know. Uh, uh, Chris, I appreciate your point of view and the uh, yeah. uh, person you were at. Uh, you know, you're right. pretty, certainly recognize there are a lot of people on fixed income uh, that are facing real problems, paying their taxes. Uh, the taxes were just due uh, this past month, they'll be due again in November. And uh, a lot of people are not in a position to, to pay that easily. Um, and first thing on the list of ways that this new source of revenue, this uh, local option tax, the first thing we put on there was paying down debt, which serves to lower tax rates. Yeah. Right? Um, Let's uh, move on to uh, town meeting day, second discussion. Last time we met, we talked about uh, the uh, Duxbury model, mm -hmm. uh, which has served to uh, allow more people to vote. Uh, there's they can vote on the town budget uh, on an Australian ballot, uh, and they have drive through voting. Um, and on the one hand, it does. Uh, go counter the uh, tradition tradition of town meeting uh, on Tuesday morning, first Tuesday morning in uh, March, which has been around for probably 100 years or, or more. Um, but on the other hand, not many working people will get that Tuesday morning off. And uh, so you get a subset of people participating in town meeting and also some of people voting on the town budget. Um, subsequently, uh, I have had a conversation with Karen. Um, uh, we, we noted that in order to change it to, uh, to uh, Duxbury form, uh, it would require a special town meeting uh, 
that would have to take place probably in November of this year. Um, and we already have a fairly significant presidential election happening in that same month. Um, so uh, what I discussed with her and would propose to you uh, would be uh, to get a budget prepared uh, for presentation uh, during the beginning uh, or to middle of January so that we could have a special meeting, uh, perhaps on a Saturday, uh, to allow more people to participate. Uh, and have a meeting dedicated to discussing the town budget and the allocation of the uh, 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 local option tax funding uh, so that uh, people like Cheryl and others that are interested in this could have a vibrant and meaningful discussion about the town budget and then we could take feedback and then make adjustments to that budget, which then would go to town meeting for our final vote at town meeting for this year. We could also put uh, something on the, uh, introduce into town meeting whether people want to change from town meeting to uh, a uh, Duxbury of is that what In we're the calling it? The, the, the Duxbury model? <laughs> yeah, I don't know. We'll nod to our neighbors to the south. Um, uh, so if, if we would be. Have a better terminology for it. Now. We would be deciding on town meeting day to change or not change town meeting day. Well, for the subsequent year. Right. Yes. Yeah. That, that would be part of this. I feel like that's. Probably a good compromise. Further discussion. Or we get one into a motion. When would this um, discussion meeting be? What month? Uh, we would need to have get input uh, by the third week of uh, January, right? I don't believe so. January, I already get this coming to mind, but I guess just to name, because just to say this is so that input we receive would be binding for a traditionally warned first Tuesday yeah. in March town meeting. We would have to receive input at some point in January to make right. changes before, because right. it requires a decent amount of notice. Right. We would have to have a, a warned budget uh, by the end of January. Uh, and again, this is the, the way, my understanding of how Duxbury works uh, is that uh, they take, they use this uh, uh, Saturday morning meeting to take input, and then the select board meets subsequently to take all that input and uh, we can make any changes to the proposed budget, and then the proposed budget uh, gets finalized and then goes for a uh, vote uh, up or down uh, on uh, Australian ballot in their drive through election. What are we finding about in terms of time? Um, to have the warning ready for a March town meeting, mm -hmm. you have to have it posted by January 31st, actually, much later than they thought. Yep. But you have a Monday holiday in January every year, which is a mm -hmm. constant blunder. <laughs> so you would have to finalize the warning, presumably on either the 13th or 27th of January, the 27th being kind of late, but doable, so. Mm -hmm. So we could have... You want to do this informational on a Saturday in January? Well, that's what I was thinking, again, yeah. uh, up for discussion. I'm thinking the, the whole point here is how do we build uh, greater participation, uh, more democratic uh, input into the town budget. Mm -hmm. um, because my observation, having been to a number of town meetings, is a lot gets discussed, uh, but you can't really either vote it up or down. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, then we spend an inordinate amount of time talking about allocations of two thousand dollars here and two thousand dollars there. Um, not to say that it's not important, but uh, it's it's not the meat and potatoes right. of the budget. Right. No, I like the Saturday idea, Roger. I do think that opens us up more to a larger democratic process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Which I think is the whole point of this entire pivot, anyway. Right. So then we have to find a Saturday that's doable, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, it just kind of falls. Well, yes. yeah, well really, just the choice. They're all bad. No, <laughs> knowing that they're all bad. Uh, <laughs> The eleventh. Sure, works for me. Do we think that we can have a budget uh, <laughs> by the eleventh? Yes, but, but bear in mind if this is just a vote on ten, unless you're this is not for it. Hmm? Sorry, it's. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. This is just to discuss <laughs> the, the line items. A meeting yeah. about the budget, I mean, which yeah, is about, advisory yeah. but not yeah. technically binding. Right. Yes. This is just uh, what we what we have in mind. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so we would have a suggested uh, <coughs> increase or decrease in the uh, uh, estimated town rate. And your proposal is to do that this year on a Saturday, even though we have to have the traditional town meeting. Yeah. Okay. As a trial, uh, do this on a trial basis. Mm -hmm. See what sort of turnout we get out, we get from it, uh, and that I think will provide some feedback as to what interest there is. If if we throw a big party and nobody shows up, uh, then we may decide. Well, the town meeting is is the end all of, uh, of town meeting. I like okay. my only question on the 11th, assuming right ends at the 11th, when only the first and the third, and as Karen noted, it gives us only one meeting to incorporate that feedback. I guess that's fine, but I'm just mm -hmm. naming that. We would probably need to clear that entire <coughs> subsequent select board agenda for incorporating that feedback before having to do the final yeah. warning. Which is, I mean, it's, oh, again, I think this is much more like a more clear and transparent input process than we've had before. But. Um, you have a meeting. Yeah, we've, we've had special meetings yeah. before. So and we do actually. actually I look at the minutes. And yeah. There are as many special <laughs> meetings as there are regular ones. And we have to meet every Monday in January, actually. And then we're calling us on January birthday, as I think Bill Shepard does as well. <laughs> so we'll just have five meetings yeah. in January. It, well, I'm saying there will be <laughs> subsequent Mondays. We do know how to have fun. Select Board Jamboree. Select Board Jamboree. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Amy. Hi there. So um, this is a question in terms of, um, I think I, if I'm hearing it correctly, you're talking about in-person options, days of the week. Are you guys considering anything like um, uh, virtual survey monkey, other methods to solicit input from the community without like a formal vote, perhaps? but yet get some insights that might help, um, just to kind of help you folks get the information you're looking for, but in more modes and methods that work for folks around the clock. Mm -hmm. Sure. Do you want to? Uh, I have a little bit of pushback on that. Okay. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to have a Saturday meeting and manage a survey monkey and do a MailChimp and be a tough meeting. To be clear, we didn't say you were doing oh, any of them, Karen. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, is the survey monkey, is this a question you're asking with the intent of finding out people's interest in changing the format of town meeting, or were you going somewhere else? Uh, more about promoting the opportunity to give them an opportunity to provide input. Yep. So I, I don't, I'm not really influencing the outcome as much as to say, I know for myself, it doesn't really matter the day of the week, I'm quite busy. Um, and I'm trying to find the time slot throughout the day that works. So I'm just thinking, I found myself at 11 o'clock at night going, oh, gotta, gotta provide this kind of feedback, and I do it in a way that's available, and sometimes that's electronic. So I'm happy to support, but I just think it might open up the communication opportunities. 
Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, it's conceivable that we could narrow down some key issues uh, at the uh, Saturday meeting uh, on the 11th of January to uh, a couple of questions that could be put out on Survey Monkey with a uh, five-day window or something like that. New year, new budget is the frame that's coming to mind for me. Um, I'll just say thank you, Amy. I really appreciate um, the idea around further input. And I think what we've been talking about mostly is the in-person logistics, because obviously right now we're required to do that for town meeting. We're also required to do that if we change the format of town meeting. But I think the whole goal of this process is to allow more folks to provide input earlier. So if we have the budget ready to be presented in person on the 11th, as Roger is saying, I think we could also look at doing um, a digital equivalent. I might propose before then, um, just in terms of time to compile. But again, having that draft, final draft ready sooner Mm -hmm. with an open call for input. And to Karen's point, I think if that's something we want to do, you know, we, I'm willing to help take on the lift to help compile feedback and input. We often get feedback and input just via email or via folks at these meetings as well. So there's a lot of ways, but. Okay, mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm puzzled uh, about the Survey Monkey th thing. Um, so at our informational meeting input Saturday, Jamboree, mm -hmm. um, we would present the public with a, this is what we were thinking, mm -hmm. and then we're going to go through essentially line by line, and we're going to discuss, are we going to... Department by department. Yeah. Or, yeah, or at least department by department. Would we do that entire exercise in a survey monkey? I don't think you can. Yeah. Uh, I don't, you know, I, I'm familiar with the monkey. Uh, <laughs> when I've seen it, it's usually about uh, what dates do you have open to, for, for a meeting. Yeah, right. uh, with like uh, maybe seven different options. Uh, but uh, I, I, I'm not the answer on this. Uh, maybe others are. Clearly, no one did the after action review, which had six different sections and said, what worked well? Feedback response box. <laughs> what didn't work well? Feedback response box. Other ideas, <laughs> feedback we, response box. Over. <laughs> I, I'm just saying, there's ways to say, do you have input on the draft budget available at this link? Yeah. And maybe mm -hmm. you do it, maybe you don't. There's no imperative to do it. But personally, I don't see the harm in adding more ways for folks to provide input on their schedule. Mm -hmm. Yeah, comment. Yes, yeah, so I was just going to say simply the same thing that I think obviously you get more input if you're in person, but it doesn't mean that that's not a good avenue to get input on big decisions. The new option tax, for example, if the select board were to ask the, the voters of the town, hey, here are our four options, our four buckets, which one of the, these buckets matters most to you, you would get a really good um, idea of where the community as a whole would like to see that, that money spent. Obviously, when you move through the budget, line by line, apartment by apartment, you have a lot of operational expenses that are really difficult to have substantial changes to. But with this option tax, that's something where people, as a voter, would probably feel like their input could be um, mm -hmm. maybe direct where these things go. That are right. important. And you might even be able to split the funding based on, you know, 36% said this and 10% said this, so potentially the funding could even split to match the, mm -hmm. the kind of division of interest. So just an idea for the board to consider. No, I, I appreciate it. And uh, just uh, I recollect that about two years ago, we did that exact exercise uh, with the ARPA funding that was allocated to us. And that's kind of what generated the idea was that, that I appreciated that as mm -hmm. a resident. So. Okay. And infrastructure over, overwhelmingly won, in case anyone was curious. And then we spent $500,000 <laughs> on it in ARPA. Um, <laughs> All right. Um, do we need a motion for this uh, to go forward, or uh, to hold a meeting? Hmm? I think we do to hold a meeting. Don't we need a motion? We're not there yet. I was. At, I move that the town of Waterbury Select Board plan that for the 2025 town meeting season. Our intention is to have a full draft budget available in January 2025 for public feedback in common, including through a large publicized in-person meeting. How are we doing, Karen? 
<laughs> Feedback from this meeting. You're up to three sentences. <laughs> I was trying to go slow. Feedback from this meeting would be used to inform changes or potential changes um, for the town meeting budget. <coughs> a question about the future format of town meeting would also be included as part of the 2025 town meeting warning. Second. Any further discussion? I'll just note, I mean, I will say the one, again, I think this is a, a great hybrid best case attempt to get this conversation moving. It does mean the actual binding town meeting vote, you know, we're doing this in January, it will not be binding in January, we didn't say we'd warn it, it's just for input. The actual binding vote to potentially change town meeting format in March, I'm just naming, is gonna be overwhelmingly attended by the people who usually attend town meeting and may be interested in it, but again, I think there's nothing to lose by trying to solicit more input, see what the opportunity is in January, and again, if nothing else, even if there isn't a desire to change the format, it's you know, front-loading the work. And Tom, does this feel good? You did give us the Christmas present last year of a full draft budget, and it was really nice, so thank you. Kevin. Uh, I just want to make sure I'm understanding the process right. The question about changing the format for town meeting, that has to happen at the meeting in November, right? That has to happen at a warned town meeting. Yes. So that could be a special warned town meeting, or in my motion, we're proposing we're doing it at normal, traditional town meeting, first Tuesday in March. So what would the discussion in November be about? It's a November. No, the, the, we, we had talked previously about doing a special meeting in November, but that would put a tremendous burden on the town clerk in addition to the presidential election. Yeah, I thought at the last meeting you said there was some deadline that had to be met. That would have been this. Yes. But, but we're, we are, we're now taking a step back from that original proposal to a sort of hybrid uh, model of just introducing this discussion session early in January, which will allow, will allow us time to make changes in the budget which will be presented as it usually is at the, uh, it'll be warned in advance and then be voted on uh, in person at the town meeting. And are we committing to having that, that deciding vote in March? I guess it doesn't hurt, it could always be voted down. I'm just, um, I don't know what my language was with yeah, regards to if we're committing that. to that. <laughs> yeah. um, we, we still have time. We're after nine. We still have time. Feedback from this yeah. meeting will be used to inform changes for the town meeting budget. Question about the future format of town meeting. So, okay, that works. Yep. Okay. Move and second any further discussion. Hearing none, all favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? All right. That is moved. Did you get your question answered? I think so. Okay. <laughs> All right. Next on the agenda is the uh, development project on town and land. <coughs> and Karen, you can, if you want to pull up the PDF I sent, or I can, or if you can let me share the screen and pull up here. This is going to come. You can make Tom a co-host. <laughs> share. All right, there we go. Oh, what do you want me to do? Make him a co-host? Yeah, then he can just share it himself and you don't have to do it. Okay. <clears throat> so this is um, not a proposal, more of a supposal at this stage, I think. <clears throat> um, what you're looking at on the screen, and hopefully it's reasonably visible. Let me move this off. <coughs> so the bottom of the screen here where the cursor is is High Street. And this is Hillcrest Terrace. This is Armory. And right here is the elementary school. Um, <coughs> spent a little time uh, with Grenier Engineering looking at this lot, which is town owned. Um, there are some constraints. The, the back areas here um, are permanently preserved for recreation. The 
town hall, there's part of a land swap deal that was done when town hall was made um, and not developable. But we started thinking about this a lot in terms of housing. A lot of that stems from the fact that I hired a zoning administrator who was a realtor. He took a look at this town on land and said, why don't we consider this for development? Um, we have an agreement with the school that there is parking provided, so the parking lot would have to stay on the lot. In this area of the lot is an existing building. Um, it's, a, it's basically an old brick building. It was the old armory at one point. Um, <coughs> it does have an asbestos shingle roof, so on, I believe, Thursday we're getting a sample taken and we'll have a quote to dismantle the roof. But the, the thought that we came up with, and again, not a proposal, is that <coughs> if we could, at the bottom of the lot here, build a new storage building, so we're thinking concrete slab, um, attractive looking building, but probably a, you know, probably a steel building um, to make it affordable. If we could do that, demolish the old building, and sell development lots and cover our costs. We've added some housing to the town. We've gotten rid of the asbestos liability. Um, we're on the ground list, done some good things. <coughs> so the, again, the sketch we came up with, not a proposal, would be eight lots, um, larger lots along the Hillcrest Terrace side. Um, that would, I think, be a little more suited for, for larger home, not larger homes, but single family homes perhaps that might match the, uh, what's across the street in the immediate neighborhood. Um, and then our thinking is, and again, just our thinking, not a proposal, is the side of the lot, um, perhaps the bottom, perhaps the four or five lots would be better suited for something with more density. And then that could be, who knows, uh, that could be duplexes, that could be condominiums. Um, so we're, we're um, I just thought it was important to introduce this concept because um, from our internal perspective, we should have quotes um, relatively soon, but our instinct based on what we know now is that um, this could be a development proposal that cash flows or at least the town breaks even on. Um, again, removing the asbestos roof and removing that liability, I think, is just a good long-term strategy. I also think that building, quite frankly, is ugly, so it wouldn't hurt to get rid of it. Agreed. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to present this at the skeletal stage. Obviously, if there was a desire to work towards a full development, there's a long public input process that could happen. Mm -hmm. But our 50,000-foot view at this stage suggests to us that Financially, it, it appears to be feasible. We don't have all the exact quotes, but the ballpark numbers we have appear to make some sense. So I thought, let's get it on the radar and, and start start planning the process if, in fact, there's desire by the select board to take this further, and if, in fact, the numbers in the end bear the fruit, we hope they will. Questions for Tom? Okay. Um, less of a question, as mm -hmm. I think I, I think I uh, concur with the neighborhood side being single family as it is mm -hmm. how it is in the rest of that neighborhood. Mm -hmm. um, but that bottom area that runs along Armory behind the school mm -hmm. as being duplexes or condominiums, I would not support those being sold off for single family units. I just think that's just a colossal waste of space in that area. Um, when we obviously could put duplexes and triplexes in that space and it would still blend in with the rest of the neighborhood well enough. It's not, you know, it's not a giant apartment building. Though that neighborhood has recently been introduced to a giant apartment building. Just well, giant, <laughs> six units, right? Uh, yes. Nine, nine, nine units. units. Yeah. 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 <coughs> and one really important consideration here is um, with the change in the zoning bylaws, the new municipal, if, if this were to happen, the new municipal storage building would require DRB approval. Mm -hmm. um, 
the development lots, the subdivision process, the housing that could be built there would not. That would just require the zoning administrative mm -hmm. approval. So, because our building is not housing? <coughs> yeah, in essence. Uh, we did not exempt ourselves from the rules. <laughs> so I think the easiest way to put it. Um, so if, again, this is something that there's community desire for and select board support for, <coughs> the intent would be that I would bring the select board at, at the very at the end stage of more of a full-fledged proposal about how we would put this out to the market. So you would get the final say, since there's no DRB, in, in suggesting what sort of housing right. you want built there. Mm -hmm. Okay. And this was presented to the Housing Task Force. <coughs> And um, what uh, what, the, what do they want on this? I think on another. the back, there's three recommendations. And I guess I would just say, like, per Tom's, I love supposal. Um, the, to Tom's sure credit, the real he word. said, I love supposal. <laughs> so, like, this is not <laughs> drawn and sketch. This is, like, concept for discussion. Yeah. Um, we had a special meeting per Tom's. Um, saying, oh, this seems like a reasonable thing, and Joe was away. Um, but you'll see point one was like, how are we getting input about this? So in the spirit of the, the uh, town meeting conversation we just had, just understanding like, what are the different hypotheticals on the site around numbers of units and things like that? Mm -hmm. um, you'll see recommendation two is about density on the site. Um, I'm glad this came up because I meant to say it in response to Amy earlier, just understanding like we have a town planning process going on to update the town plan that is seeking input from people about, from the community as a whole, about what we want in various places. This is actually part of um, the phase one bylaw that was already done. So there is some like actual language we've adopted on the book saying like in this area, we'd like high density housing. So there certainly was Mm -hmm. Housing Task Force and Planning Commission members saying, given that it's town owned, we'd really like to see potentially higher density there. Um, and then so I, higher than is being proposed. Yes, I'm I would not, say I'm not, I'm not proposing density. I was just suggesting that the the well, ones down the side would <laughs> strike me as being a little more appropriate for higher density than the ones at the top of the lot. Or their group was, I guess, the the comment made by folks was it would be worthwhile looking at what the town has already adopted with regards to the purpose of that zoning district, which in general has to do with higher density housing. Uh -huh. um, and then there's just notes that the housing task force has looked at different types of affordability around different types of houses and units um, and would need more info about kind of the process around what needs would be best met on this site. So as is often the theme for us was kind of a like, would love some more information, but And I guess the question is, uh, information from whom? Uh, how, how do we... I think a more concrete proposal. I mean, I would say, uh, like... In, more concrete proposal, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think just in general, it was, you know, candidly, I was the person there. We didn't have town staff, and it was like, why are we doing eight plots like this? And as Tom is saying, this isn't really a formal proposal. It was like, well, this is cool. We have questions about how many units we're doing where and why, and note that this is higher density housing. <laughs> in my mind, it's something that could come back with the proposals around this amount of units based on sewer being here and this is the process for town residents being involved. I think, you know, I think it's fair to summarize there was strong support for more proposals to expand housing, but um, just questions about the logistics and the input for this particular proposal. Actually, Karen, can you pull the map up? Can I pull the map up mm -hmm. for just a second? I just, I have been people to know Sorry, it's, um, I got up really early this morning. It was late for me. Alyssa mentioned sore. I'd forgotten to say that, and I'm mad at myself. So there is um, there is not a nearby sore line. It's a bit of a challenge. There's a sore line at the top of the lot, but it's it's uphill. That's so, never good. <laughs> so the the current thinking is that a sore line would go on this edge of the lot, and to keep cost down, it would be buried not in the road. Uh -huh. And then when you get down to High Street, the sewer line actually runs behind the home. So if you were not able to work out something and get an easement from a homeowner, you'd probably you'd just go down the road. 
yeah. and connect. And so that's one of the other costs that we need to overcome as part of this. Right. Do you have an estimation for that cost? I know it's not a huge sewer, but I know sewers are expensive. <laughs> not exact, but um, depending where we connect, 100 to 150. Which, in theory, could be paid for by selling off those lots. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this is sort of a, a different scenario with the town actually being the developer, right? Um, <coughs> so we're, we're sort of in the driver's seat, but we're also uh, representing the, the best interests of the town. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and uh, so uh, I guess, <coughs> Tom, given these three recommendations, uh, would you be able to come back with a, a more concrete uh, proposal? Yeah, I'd like more than a week, though. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give you okay. <laughs> How about a month? <laughs> That's funny. Okay. And I also think particular outreach from that area would be really important yeah. just in terms of, I will say, as it was, I was like, I can't believe this is on our agenda without having door knocked in that area. But like, I do think it's really important that we, again, engage folks in what do they want to see in that area. Right. So how do we best do that? I'll door knock. You are going to do it. Yeah, absolutely. Right. But do we door knock at the supposal stage or do we get a more concrete? I think we say we're going to have a more concrete proposal from the town manager at insert select board meeting date okay with a specific street address not development of town owned land you know when i was doing my outreach to the summer at the uh, farmers market i actually ran into renters budding renters on high street who were very interested in this yeah uh, oh, great. and i was able to uh, give them the broad overview of the proposal which was a little bit different at that point <coughs> but uh, you know they're so one door is already been locked. As, as, as a former <laughs> renter on High Street, huh. I would have been chomping at the bit over a, something like this. Hmm. Part of I the you still chomp. I will, I will be chomping. <laughs> I will be chomping quite hard. Part of the interest for me came from the fact that a number of people in the floodplain reached out and said they, they'd like to perhaps move out of the floodplain, yeah. but they don't want to leave Waterbury. Mm -hmm really know where to go, you know, the no inventory, all that, and we sort of think, well, maybe we can look at land we own and other opportunities there. Mm -hmm. I can door knock on Randall and Elm Streets. You have, they've never engaged on a neighboring proposal on a municipally owned parcel, right? <coughs> yeah, to do with housing? Nothing, nothing, <laughs> nothing we're doing that, no. You have hands up. Yeah. Right. Cheryl and Amy. All right, uh, let's see, who talked last? Uh, I think Amy, so we'll go with Cheryl. Okay, thank you. Uh, Alyssa, thank you. You brought up a lot of the concerns that I already had about having a property built up on that street. Um, there are mostly single or family homes now that used to be apartments. There's a lot of apartments that were just built on the end of the street, but um, everybody I've talked to now is, is single family homes. So my concern would be trying to change the theme of the neighborhood. I'd, I'd really like to keep it single family homes. I think that would be uh, really good, especially across from the school. Um, we want to have a, a lot of green space. There's always there's already parking problems by the school. So the more apartments that you put in there, the more buildings you put in there, the less green space that you have. And yes, I know the schools across from the potential buildings that you're going to have, but uh, that shouldn't be the, the green space. It's great to have it, but I ask that you think about that when you're trying to jam in a lot of buildings into that, that space. Um, my other concern is you've already stated that there's a lot of sewer issues, so how does that affect the people on High Street when uh, they've got to dig up their yards to put in and use to put that, that set up? So again, I, I have to think about that. I, my parents live on High Street, so my concern is that uh, they don't have a lot of upheaval um, and uh, not a lot of traffic. 
Line. The thought is that we need to know the cost component to this, but um, in the end, I don't want to be a developer. I want to market it and essentially hire, ideally, a developer to do it all. They can demo the old, build our buildings, and, the water and, and, and deal with the lines. Uh, sorry, Tom, <laughs> speak. Um, yeah, maybe we'll be done with the exact fit, but, but it, it would be to get community input about what housing is desired there and then put it to the market. And if the developer, um, if the community input is for density, for example, let the developer tell us exactly what size and type of units they want to build, because they know better than us. But are you, like, I guess the idea, are they developing for the town, or are they buying the land and developing for themselves and going through the normal process to get permits and public input for that development? Because we own the land, if, if there's, if the community has certain desires about what they want to see, that the, there, there'd be a contract with the developer that they'd have to build to those desires. Um, doesn't so mean that doesn't mean that ownership of those buildings. No, doesn't mean I want to own the buildings. Doesn't mean I want to be the developer. It's just that you would sell the buildings to a developer knowing what you're going to get. Sell the lots. Sell the lots. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Sell the lots. Sorry. Was I saying buildings? And here's and here's the the guideline. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So you have to write the RFP that's rigid enough to take in community input, but flexible enough for the developers to make adjustments that makes it feasible for them. All right. Any other questions? Yeah. Eric Gross. Uh, Eric Gross. <laughs> Hi. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm very interested in this idea. If I do end up losing my house on Union Street, because I very much like to stay in Waterbury, so I appreciate you all uh, considering this and making it a possible option in the future. But uh, I think it's a good idea. So, uh, thank you. Sure. Thanks, Eric. Appreciate it. Developers about this yet? 
Nothing formally. We just had sort of side conversations about it. I think every local developer was, it would be interested in this. Mm -hmm. <coughs> okay. Uh, and so uh, you'll be back uh, to us uh, first meeting in uh, October with uh, more details sure. uh, for the proposal. And uh, meanwhile, we'll be getting uh, community input. Uh, maybe we can talk about community input at the next meeting. That's great. Quick question. Yeah, Karen. Do you, in this exercise, do you put deed restrictions? How do you ensure <coughs> once you sell it that it's developed the way you want it developed? It ought to be a contract for deed restrictions. I'd, I'd have to talk to the land use attorney about specifically how they'd want that done. Yeah, I'm just thinking of deeds I read and yeah. Wondering how, how that gets memorialized. So, yeah. Okay. Any further comments, questions on this one? <coughs> we'll move forward. Uh, Town of Hyde Park for kennel services. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yes. Um, so I've been the I've been the default animal control mm -hmm. officer because we haven't had one actually. Um, now that I've learned to put my phone on silent when I go to bed, it generally works okay. Um, I've had a number of calls related to, um, most of my calls are not related to dogs, which are the only things that we regulate via our ordinance. Um, so it's, it's simply I politely say that your dispute with your neighbor's cat is for you and your neighbor, and, and if it rises to a higher level, that's for the Vermont State Police. Um, you get a lot of cat issues? Actually, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Which surprises me. Keep them on a leash. <laughs> the dog issues, I've been able to navigate without an animal control officer. They're not that frequent. Um, <clears throat> there's been a couple times where the town has lucked out. I received a call probably a month ago um, that the police had picked up a dog. Um, and it was over the line and bolt. And if it wasn't, it would have been a bit of a challenge to deal with. It was late night and a weekend, and what do you do at that point? Um, local kennels have said, we'll take a dog if, it's, um, if we have room, and we're not going to guarantee you room. Um, space is at a premium. It's a problem throughout, I think, Vermont. So Hyde Park went and built their own. They sent a draft. They sent an agreement along um, to guarantee us spots, and I countered and said that we really don't need spots very often, but when you need them, you need them. Um, they've got some fixed costs, so their agreement had a has a set price um, had set price of five thousand dollars a year. They've uh, their administrator stated he would lower it to three thousand dollars a year. That being said, their administrator just resigned. But I'm hoping that no. that email chain will be sufficient. <laughs> <laughs> but um, <laughs> I think it's cheap insurance because in the event we need to kennel that dog, um, hard to do without a kennel. Mm -hmm. The the other cost, the daily fees, presumably would be passed along to the owner when the owner goes to reclaim that dog. That is not always the case. There's not always someone who reclaims a dog, and then you've got to deal with that challenge. Um, but we've been um, skating on ice that's a little bit thin here. That being said, in talking to the town attorney, if a dog is picked up and we don't have a facility or an animal control officer, we don't have a legal obligation to take the dog. I'm able to say legally that we simply don't have the capacity. Um, and, and you've got to somehow figure that out. And I can try to help, but we don't have the obligation despite having an ordinance. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but I also think that if we have a shelter, it makes it easier to have an animal control officer because then they don't have to worry about dealing with the animal in the middle of the night should that call come. Mm -hmm. So do we have a price? We don't have a fixed price yet? Is this, uh, <laughs> it would be, th be $3,000 for the fixed annual fee, and I believe that's in the agreement. It's five on this one. Yes, and they've agreed, they've agreed that. 
And then the daily fees, again, if there was a responsible owner, would be passed back to the owner. And so our ordinance says that the owner cannot reclaim the dog that we have to kennel until they pay all the fees that go with it. Mm -hmm. so $25 a day? Yes. <laughs> Not at all. So there is a version of three thousand. There's an email chain between myself and the administrator. So. Okay. And does three spots feel right, given that you're saying? Was it a, uh, I, one year I suggested we did not need three spots. <clears throat> I suggested that one would be likely more than enough, and I tried to um, reduce that a little further, but no avail. I think to some extent Hyde Park bit the boat and built the facility yeah, and they, they feel like they want to. Really yeah, they want to. Yeah. All right. Do we have a motion? Discussion? Yeah, I, I guess I just wanted to point out when I first read this, I, I kind of balked at the idea of $5,000. I guess I didn't know how much of an issue this was for us, but <laughs> 5000 3000 is it, uh, uh, you know better than anybody else, Tom. Being a, I, I went through our I went through our history, and it's actually been a long time since we've had any any real kennel fees. Yeah. Um, we we Do had we haven't had a kennel, right? <coughs> right, and we have an animal control officer. Now there was a period um, in the 2010s where we had five grand in expenses every year for this to it. And to some extent, I, I hate to say this because I don't want to grant, denigrate the position, but when you have an animal control officer, you tend to have more expenses associated with these things. Um, my stock answer to people, I, I've dealt with some issues and tried to adjudicate things, but my stock answer has generally been to, to try to help people sing a little kumbaya, but also to say that I'm, you know, it's Saturday at 10 o'clock at night, I gotta go to bed. Right. So. Can you take the dog for the night, and then we'll try to find the owner in the morning? And generally, that's worked out. But we're again, we're on thin ice here a little bit. Other questions? Yeah, we would have to. We have to update the animal control ordinance anyway because of the fee schedule. But if I'm reading it right, we put in a fee schedule of twenty dollars per day. And those are our costs, but we also. So it would be forty-five a day. <coughs> Yes, because it's, uh, it's our cost plus whatever fees uh, we incur. Okay. Well, I do know that the state's raising the license fees, so we are going to have to look at this. Yeah. I think we don't update the ordinance, just the fee schedule. Just I the fee schedule, yeah. yeah. I apologize if I said it differently. The fee schedule is attached separately. Um, so, dog gets out, gets picked up, it gets transported <coughs> to Hyde Park, and Say it's not a vicious dog, but it's it got out. It's been picked up, and that owner dog jumped the fence. That owner's got to pay forty five dollars a day to get the dog out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a lot. That's a lot. Now you got to figure out it's in Hyde Park. Right? Now you got to figure out it's in Hyde Park. <laughs> yeah, first your dog's missing, and then you got to figure out where it is. <laughs> That being said, but it should be licensed, right? right. So if it's then licensed, Karen knows it's easy to, to figure out. Answer her phone at ten o'clock. Oh no, of course. No, but if it's no, but if it's licensed, we can contact the owner. Right. Yes, if it's a licensed dog. Yes, I mean I can get the information from right. all my people. Yeah, if somebody picked up a dog and attacked on it, it wouldn't. In theory, it shouldn't even go to Hyde Park. Yeah. I should have a phone number and an email for that person. Right. It wouldn't even be transported. But if it's unlicensed, then they're. And honestly, most people that I deal with, um, you know, most dogs are very friendly. So most people just say, oh, yeah, I'm happy to take the dog for the night, no problem. <coughs> and then by the morning, yeah. it's usually the owner is found and Lisa, everyone's Lisa's happy. for profit dogs. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's a good point. It's got a little bit of a tag. Yeah. Yeah, someone, wants, someone wants that dog. Generally, yeah. find the owner pretty quickly. Um, it's the, the wandering ones. Um, and again, it is, we are within our legal rights to say that um, in those instances that, sorry, but you've got to deal with the dog on your own. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
How much longer do you intend to be uh, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, it seems to be working okay, unless you all are getting complaints. Um, but it, it's, really it's, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> My dog is happy. Karen's dog is happy. <laughs> it's not an in in a inordinate amount of work, and, and I think in general, um, you know, the, the ordinance update where, where we had the ability to find people has helped because that, um, there's been some cases in the lately where we've told people, you've, you know, we're aware of your dog, it's unlicensed, we're going to give you to the end of the week. And otherwise, the fine schedule kicks in, and that's, that's solved a lot of these issues, I think. Well, and the reason I ask is that uh, by having the town manager also uh, be our uh, animal control officer, we're saving money. <coughs> So maybe it's worth the three thousand dollars if it buys uh, our town manager some peace of mind, knowing that uh, he can send a problem dog to Hyde Park uh, if need be. Uh, that, that maybe we need to make that investment. What happens if the dog's not clean? It goes to a different. It goes Hyde to Park owns a new dog. Oh yeah, <laughs> they could have a sanctuary. Yeah, I mean, I they could build a sanctuary to go with the to go with the shelter. <laughs> If the dog's not cleaned, we, we try to bring it to a shelter that will. So it still, it still becomes our. It's, it's, it's okay. still Waterbury's dog? Yeah. 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 Honestly, I, if it's a friendly dog, I'll just bring it home. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was just thinking that. But I would also I would also like to visit this shelter. Yeah. Um, with regard to this, I think it seems reasonable um, on minor technicalities. I would note it's September, and we operate on a calendar year fiscal year, so five renewals of a year starting in September. I mean, I'm just saying I think we totally do it. I think it's reasonable for the $3,000. I don't know if we have our years begin in January and pay them $1,000 for the last quarter of the year or something to that effect. And I will note this has four one-year renewals, and it's fine with me, but um, do we start with two? <laughs> if this is a brand new thing, and evaluate then how it's working? Is that a commitment? Or we can terminate it? It's in the terms. Uh, yeah. Yeah, hi. Um, question, how many dogs approximately uh, are we picking up and needing to cart to a shelter? It's a rare thing. I'm sorry? It's a rare thing. It's approximately zero right now. Yes. And the other thing is how do we, who would be taking the dog to the shelter? Uh, if a dog is running loose and it's being picked up, uh, maybe he's a friendly dog, maybe he isn't. Uh, but sometimes there are aggressive dogs, and we don't have, you know, we don't have a dog catcher. Uh, so if we have virtually no dogs being picked up as it is, why are we spending 3000 or $5,000? I don't get it. I mean, yes, there should be a shelter. Uh, I, I don't disagree with that. But how much need is there for one? And I'm really concerned if you get an aggressive dog, who's going to get that dog up to the right? Thank you. Thanks, Ed. So if there's an aggressive dog, um, I'd call Fish and Wildlife. Um, they're helpful. We've also got the, I don't know what you call it, but the pole with the... Mm -hmm. With the thing? With the, yeah. yeah. The yeah. lasso. <laughs> and we've got a crate in the basement. Um, <coughs> Anne is entirely correct. This is a very rare thing. It's an insurance policy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. More of an assurance policy, I think. Yeah. 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 The problem is that without this, we have no place to come. We have a cage in the basement. <laughs> well, then negotiate further. Like, can we do, you know, one spot? I think, I think just saying, like, we'd be willing. We see the value in your service. Yeah, well, I can come back. I, can I just, if we have going from zero spots to three spots, do we go from zero to one for yeah. two thousand for a year or two and yeah, so see how it, it's going? Do we just direct the uh, town manager to negotiate uh, for one spot? Um, and, uh, 
year to sign a one year contract to see how it goes. Okay, I can do that. Well, let's just do our math here. You know. Okay. We're, we're winding up here, folks, just uh, FYI. Uh, let's go with uh, Cheryl first. Just a quick question, do our licensing fees, would that help pay for that? Or, or where do those licensing fees go when we like the dog? Because typically that goes for out of Texas. But just, would that help offset some of that cost? I just, I, I'm just asking, I don't know. Okay. Uh, um, well, we licensed, I just licensed my dog, he's number 400 and two at you know, 11 bucks and six of that, go, no, excuse me, five of it goes to the state, going to be seven. Yeah. So, who can do that math? Like so, so 2,400 bucks. Yeah. $2,400 is what we yeah. net uh, yeah. of uh, dog fees. 500 of that goes to the tags that I buy. Oh. So we, we have to yeah. yeah. It's not a lot of money, Cheryl, to answer your question, to offset much of anything. Uh, but we are going to be revising fees soon, so. How many dogs do you have, Cheryl? <laughs> I think I see 400 dogs a day on deck. 6,000. Okay. <laughs> now we're talking. Yeah. The money that the state collects, a lot of it goes towards the V-SNP program, which is a program for individuals who can't afford to spay or neuter. Here. And they can apply for and be awarded free or discounted services. So that's a really important service that the state takes care of, and that's what their money, the money that they collect goes towards. And the $2 is going towards fish and wildlife, I think. Mm -hmm. Strange place to pack it on. Well, well they are. You can call them up, call, call them right the dog. That's worth the money. <laughs> um, I just did some quick math, Roger, and it's yeah. $1,666 per cage at the per spot at the shelter. So if we are if we are trying to get because if we we're getting three spots for five grand. Yeah. By now three grand. Yeah. But now it's three grand, but are we only requesting the one spot? Yeah. Can we negotiate for the price of one spot using that math? Uh, they're, they're probably going to draw a line at some point. But let's we see. Try. We've uh, directed the town manager to negotiate on our behalf. Uh, let's see if we can get the best deal possible before we jump on this uh, opportunity. Okie dokie. All right. Oh, I'm sorry. Anything we, we forgot to go ahead. Um, some of the money uh, from the uh, that you were talking about earlier, the uh, the tax use money, some of that could be used for the dogs. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. <coughs> oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the uh, Watley. Mm. I don't remember the dogs being on the list, but they could be. Um, all right, I think we're done with dogs, and we're on to agenda for the next meeting. So far, we've got the River, River of Lights Parade Ooh, great. permit and safety plan, uh, potential proposed development of armory. Oh, that comes off. We just did that. Well, did you want input process, Roger? Yes, I would like input yeah. process. So, so we could just, just say input process yeah. for feedback on. Mm -hmm. yeah. Feedback. And then, yeah. Karen, you could copy that one again to the seventh, because it sounds like that's when Tom is coming back, right? Is that what you said? That, or later that than that? Seven should be fine. And Roger, I would like to tack on um, a continuation of the conversation about the division of this year's local option tax revenue. Yep. Yeah. Are we going to have new information? I, I will, say that. Okay. We'll I, I will. I will speak to concerned parties to see if I can put together a nice little presentation. Love that. Okay. Love it. At least for one of the subjects. <laughs> Uh, I don't know if I do. Or, well, or to be honest, if it's the housing trust, I'm just proposing we call it housing trust. I'm not like disputing. Yeah. I guess sure. I'm just questioning. Like, are you planning to present an infrastructure or a housing trust? I suppose I could do both if I spoke to concerned parties for both subjects. But I was planning on speaking to Joe Camerata. 
Right. So then I guess just my question is, should it just be housing trust proposal? Per your point, we've already voted sure. it into yeah, yeah. existence. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Is that I mean, your intent to have the discussion Yeah, I mean, that's that was essentially, yeah. I'm just thinking. So I was hoping that I could connect with two subjects, but <laughs> but in a week, in a week's time, I don't know how much I can accomplish. Okay. Right. I can Let's definitely do one subject. Uh, you know, we, 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 to get back on schedule, this is a special meeting. Mm -hmm. We're back on schedule next week with our regular meeting, mm -hmm. and then we don't have another meeting scheduled until the first uh, Monday in October. Which, uh, yeah, okay. So I, I guess if I want to change the name of the agenda item, it's the, the housing trust fund out allocation, I guess. Because okay. I can I can definitely make you a presentation for that. Great. Good. Um, we'll put it on. Tom, did you mention about um, no. uh, um, the and if it was infrastructure initiatives, were you <coughs> I can certainly have some do you think next week is a week's <coughs> enough time? Or? It won't take Bill Wardrow very long to spend some money, trust me. We want to put that on as well? I'm certainly happy to do that. Oh, we need it. Okay. Infrastructure. I'm so sorry, Ian. Um, say it one more time? Just want to go through what's already here. Uh, adopt specific questions for the rental registry. Um, do, you, do you want to speak to that? <laughs> That's, um, yep, the, the ordinance was adopted. Um, but the specific questions that we publicize and have people answer has to be adopted by the select board. Mm -hmm. and, so, and that being said, it, it's not um, it's not a complex list of a hundred questions. It's pretty basic stuff, you know, name, ownership, information. Okay. So I don't think it's going to require multiple meetings or a huge amount of time. Okay. Okay. Well, we have the answer on public records. I know that came up with the registry. Or I guess that would be a thing I would request with that is just if if and what portions of questions would be exempt, if any. I, <laughs> I know it's personally identifying details, but whatever that is. Yeah, I'll, have, I'll have an answer on that. It's okay. Do we? No, we can save that for October. Yeah, so could uh, we... Yes. Tom has. The I agree. street name I been prefer adopted okay. by the okay. to change your program. I think so. Okay, check with Mike. I think so. Okay. Because okay. when I wrote the agenda the first time, I mistakenly thought we were talking about. Yeah, no, I understand. So. Mm -hmm. It wasn't until mm, Armory Woody Drive Avenue yeah. that I realized my mistake. <coughs> so I just want to be consistent about how I advertise it. I know. Do we just call it like town land with town garage, <laughs> school parking lot? Like I'm just, we don't have to be <laughs> opaque about it. Asbestos <laughs> 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 shed. Yeah, so. <laughs> I don't know who even knows it is that. Yeah. I don't know if there's yeah. a street sign up. I don't know. We say between Hill and Hillcrest. Yeah. Between High Street and Hillcrest. Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah. All right, we'll figure it yeah. out when we find. It does. There is a street sign. Does there is say, a Woody Avenue street sign. No, it doesn't say Woody Avenue. Right, that's my question. It says Armory. Armory, right. oh, definitely. Yeah. Renaming okay. streets in honor of our public works <laughs> We could. <laughs> we had to shuffle our way for a minute there, you know. <laughs> I mean, to avoid, I mean, we have two armories. Two <laughs> armory I think that's what happened. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think that's so, what happened is I think the state 911 folks reached out to zoning and said you need to rename the road. Yeah, that's so. exactly what I think happened too. And zoning came up with what? <laughs> Yeah. And I wasn't going to argue against but that. There's a, but I don't really care what you read. The street, but the street sign doesn't. This uh, is going to be on the front page. <laughs> <laughs> when did this happen? Yeah. I mean, the clear plan that we looked at says, the, the the say that says Woody. Corner, Google has not caught up to this. So I, no. I just, I, I didn't know if it had been official. I think it, it probably has been adopted. Did it get adopted? Yeah, 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 for next meeting. I don't know. Does it need an official adoption? I think so. I don't think I didn't it was. I didn't hear my decision today. I, I, I heard it from Mike Bishop today. Yeah. And I didn't know. He didn't say that it was. I didn't understand that it had gone through yet. That was just I don't. Problem. We have I to approve that. That's, that's a great area for me. I don't think that okay. the select board would consult it. I think we should go to the next week. I mean, with all due respect, like 102 South Main Street became Gardner Lane. You probably don't know that, and it just happened because 
911 tells us you're changing this and we have what? to change it. Your nine unit apartment building on High Street isn't the same number it used to be. It's a whole new number. Yeah. Like we. The, Oh yeah, no, it's fine. There used to be, there was like a black bear lane or something that was on an agenda of ours um, in the past. That's the only I reason think, I say I it. I think not the relationship maybe has evolved into basically they're telling my this has to be changed and go change it. So who's the they then? Um, the 911 coordinator for the state of Rome. Asks for the name to be changed and then they need to come up with a name on the fly and give it to them. Yes. <laughs> we also yes. have a local Mike is our town 911 yes. yes. coordinator. Yes. So but it's he, mm -hmm. I don't think he is, but, and I, I don't want to speak out of school, I don't think he has the authority to name things without their approval. Who's okay. approval? The, the 911 from the state. Like he can propose a name and they have to approve the name. How did they come up with Woody We could do beginning of meeting trivia. <laughs> there is a guy that's put offices down. I mean, Woody just standing there? And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I, I can't answer that, but... I, a good I, name. I, I was trying to... Can you imagine him having to tell the department to go change the sign to be his name? <laughs> <laughs> the call boss. Okay. I'll get the, I'll get the right answer and make sure it's right on the next <laughs> Uh, we will Thanks, think, Karen. memorialize it. We may need the yeah. public works director here. <laughs> uh, make it official. We need a picture. Okay. Woody <laughs> Avenue. When they put the sign in, do a picture. Thumbs up. Okay, uh, let's get through this. Um, Velco power poles. On I Bush think Hill. Pole with a knee, right? Not too well. yeah. No, we're taking one. On <laughs> <laughs> uh, Bush Hill Road, we, we need to approve that. No, this is just um, information. I'll, I'll, I'll likely have a draft resolution, uh -huh. but basically the, the short version is one of the big laminated power poles okay. failed wow. prematurely. They're putting in a, I believe, three poles that are temporary, which the neighbors hate, mm -hmm. and it's understandable. They're kind of right in their backyard. Mm -hmm. The long-term fix is for a new metal pole to go over the original laminated one, which the neighbors are okay with. Mm -hmm. But they, they're asking, I think, for town support to ensure the temporary fix doesn't become the permanent fix. Uh, okay, that's right. Mm -hmm. But it's always an emergency Velcro ruling of which the town has no authority to weigh well, in. Well, it's a danger to the yeah. concern, right? Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, yes. I will both wear the dunce hat and volunteer to take minutes, but I will note that we have nothing about flood or mitigation. We did have a need to define roles between various groups, and we have five Mondays in this month. And so I'm just noting, do we attempt a one-hour meeting that staff would not be required to attend? Um, I'm available. That's all I'm saying. On the 30th? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was thinking about putting that back on the agenda, too. Um, I mean, just in the immediate term, there is a tropical storm growing. Uh, good. Actually, I was just And we have the handbook. I'm just feeling like after tonight, we have the handbook. We have and they, roles of crew, the Natural Disaster Response Committee, and us. We and, have this grant position. I mean, disaster, we could have a flood-only meeting or a mitigation-only meeting, let alone all the other things we talk about. And the flood, or the... Disaster Response Committee um, will meet before the 30th. Okay. So they'll have their edits, though it's yes. kind of crude. And are you feeling um, comfortable enough uh, that we can wait uh, between the 9th and the 30th? I think they're proposing another meeting, Roger. Yeah, no, but they're, uh, what I heard was the 30th. For this meeting, proposed meeting, no? Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, the 30th. Yeah. 30th, yeah. So we, that's three weeks from today. We just go with the uh, fingers crossed until then. <coughs> Are you um, proposing eliminating the 16th or adding an additional? No, no, no. Yeah. 16th is what we were just discussing. Okay. But what I was hearing, uh, maybe incorrectly, was that we were proposing <coughs> to do a full on meeting to discuss. Who's going to do what between crew and paternity committee in the town uh, in order 
to prepare for the next uh, natural disaster. And doing this on the 30th? Yeah. Okay with that? Mm -hmm. When um, I'm looking at, this is kind of stupid, but I'm looking at sat images now from Noah of the active storm in the Gulf. Francine. Francine. Why are they always going? Um, we almost had Hurricane Chris, but it dissipated. I was really excited for that. Um, uh, but <laughs> I think yes, Roger. But Stop let's that. tweak the wording. Um, but I'm, I'm, I can't find anything on when it would potentially affect the Northeast yeah. this week, next week. I don't think the modeling was there yet. Yeah. We'll call an emergency meeting sooner yeah, we'll if needed, or we yeah, could yeah. add to the agenda on the 16th if it right. needed. I think scheduling for the 30th is prudent given that we are at 10.05, so I have not yet crossed into full Alyssa's not finest self. But <laughs> for me, keeping them shorter is <laughs> advantageous, and we can give crew and, I think, folks adequate warning and just saying, you know, understand you weren't ready tonight, would love to revisit on the 30th, mm -hmm. then we can work yeah. out yeah. that draft on the 16th. All right, uh, with that uh, settled, uh, do we need any uh, executive sessions? So, I, I do not. Okay. Perfect. Cool. I move to adjourn. Second. Move to second. second. All in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you.